This meeting of the Tacoma Park City Council to order. I'm Ruben Snipper, and I'm sitting in for uh, the mayor, who's out of town. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Williams. Councilmember Wright. Here. Councilmember Clay. Here. Councilmember Robinson. Here. Councilmember Siemens. Present. Councilmember Snipper. Here. Councilmember Schultz. Here. Our council meeting tonight is a little bit different because we're going to do uh, Ward tonight uh, first um, as a way to get started. And I'm glad to see uh, lots of people here. And if I put on my glasses, I'll actually have to see who is here. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Um, and we're going to do it slightly different uh, the way than we usually do for ward uh, nights, which is we're going to have the council member from the ward sort of um, interact with you and run the show. So I'm going to turn it over to <coughs> Council Member Colleen Clay to um, do that. Well, I'd like to ev welcome everybody to Ward 2 night and thank everyone for, for coming out. I know everyone has very busy schedules, but it's great for people to come out and, and participate in the uh, city uh, activities and uh, come to the council meetings. Tonight is a special night because we have uh, folks here from the staff who are able to uh, talk to us about issues. And the way we usually do council meetings is people get three minutes and they say their piece and they move on and the next person gets their three minutes. But this is actually uh, more of an interactive meeting. So you can ask questions and get answers from the staff that are here and from the, uh, the council members that are here. So um, I know that a lot of people are here to talk about the sidewalks tonight. and so. I'd like to say a little bit about what I think about the sidewalks and um, what I think is important in the city about the sidewalks. Uh, I, I support sidewalks, and the reason that I support sidewalks is because I think it's important to live in a community where uh, everyone can have accessibility to their community, where everyone can participate in a community that is inclusive of everybody. Um, I've worked in the civil rights field for uh, S several years in the federal government and other work that I have done. And it's always been interesting to me to watch the, the history of civil rights and the emergence of, of issues for different folks. And I think that um, creating inclusive communities is, is something that we have to work at all the time. And we become aware of new issues around inclusiveness uh, as time passes and different issues emerge. And I would say that uh, you know, the area of disability rights and disability access <coughs> is a, a more uh, recent issue in the awareness of the American public and our communities than uh, some other, some other uh, civil rights issues have been. And it's a, it's a challenging issue in our time. Um, I think that one of the reasons why I, I, I personally don't have much of a leap to go to support accessibility is because I grew up in a household with a, a brother who was in a wheelchair. And my brother was born in 1969 at a time when, you know, there weren't curb ramps and there, you know, accessibility wasn't an issue. My mother had to carry my brother around a lot and it affected the places that we could go. And I can see the impact that that has on people. And I spend a lot of time in the, uh, in the work, working with folks in, in the community and come in contact with a lot of people who uh, have mobility and accessibility issues and that happens a lot in my work and so I work around it a lot. It's not a really big leap for me to understand why accessibility issues are important. Um, and I acknowledge that that's, you know, that's not true for everybody because I know that personally in my life my understanding of other civil rights issues didn't come naturally and I had to spend some time learning about them and gaining an understanding of those things. And um, one of the things that's important to me is that as we talk about this issue, that our community have a place for people to come to understand what's important about that. You know, I will freely admit I grew up in a, an all-white community. I don't think I saw a black person other than on television until I moved out of my parents' house. And, um, and that was a learning experience for me. Um, and I had, to, I, had, I had to spend energy on that. Um, and and you sort of wrap my head around that and open myself to the idea that I had to come to understand other people. And so, you know, for me personally, the, the request that I would make of, of the community is that people expend the energy to come to understand 
the issue of accessibility and the different ways that it's important to people. Um, and, and so th that's my personal position on it. The second thing I want to say about sidewalks is that I think that the city administration owes the community uh, information about the process. I think that, uh, that they owe the community a process by which they can follow, a way that the community can understand what's happening. And I understand that that hasn't happened and that needs to change. And, and I think that, that the, the city staff understand that as well, that, that we can't kind of trudge, trudge through this and sort of wait for each neighborhood association to define the way that they're going to address this issue. And, and so that's work that I think that the city has to do. And hopefully we'll do that in consultation with the community so that we can really develop um, a, a way that people can understand the process and can participate in the process um, and that we can put that together and work on that together as a community. Um, I think that some of the things that the city needs to effectively communicate to people besides why it's important are, are what are the legal issues around it. You know, we know that there are legal issues around the accessibility and we need to understand what those are. I know that they're also a little bit amorphous. I think there's draft accessibility regulations from the mid, the mid uh, like, like 2005 era. So, you know, they're, they're at the federal level, I don't think there's a great understanding. When I read the accessibility information, I see that some places where it says that there's 36 inch wide sidewalk is the minimum. Some places where it says 1.2 meters, which works out to being four feet in places where it says, you know, that it's five meters on it. So I think that um, part of the, the struggle that the city has is to decide sort of what standards they're going to adhere to and what is the city going to do to help um, reduce the risk in what is somewhat of an unknown environment. Um, there are legal cases that I think that the city should share with the, uh, with the um, residents so that they can understand what our risk is as a community to not address some of the accessibility issues. And those are, those are some of the things that... Um, that I think that the city administration owes to the residents. And the thing that I think that the council owes to the residents is that I think that the council has to show some leadership on this issue, both to, to get us to the point where we can have an administrative process that our constituents can understand, but also to engage the dialogue about why this is important for our community. You know, why are accessibility issues important? And how can we have a, a conversation about these issues that is, is fair and reasonable and that doesn't, you know, pit trees against people in wheelchairs or, you know, privacy issues against um, the, the ability to use your scooter or to have um, uh, an accessible sidewalk as we, people want to age in place and, and be able to walk across, a, you know, a smooth surface and have have a way to get to the bus as you get older if you're not driving, you know, that you can get to the bus. And we should be able to have that conversation as a community. And I think that it is the council's job to lead that conversation and make the space for that conversation to happen. And um, that's what I have to share about sidewalks. And I would like to invite people to come and speak. Uh, if you haven't been at the Schnazzy New Auditorium, this, um, this podium here goes up and, up and down, and it has a switch that's on what I guess would be your left side as you approach the podium that raises and lowers the podium. We, we're going to ask everyone when they talk to talk into the microphone. So if you go back to your seat and you have more to say, we're going to ask you to get up and come back to the microphone because um, then uh, it's recorded. And I want to listen to people and not take notes, so it would be good to have it on the recording. If you um, have trouble getting uh, up and moving to the microphone, we have, a, we have a portable mic so you can raise your hand and we can bring you a portable microphone that you can use. Um, did we, did we do a sign-up list tonight? No. Great. So um, go ahead and, and uh, come, up, come on up to the podium. If maybe a couple people could get in line and a couple of the seats up here, we could move folks along. So is there someone who would like to comment or ask a question? Do I have to press a button? I guess not. No, you just not. Um, I'm Emily Kirschland. I live at 7217 Garland Avenue. And I do not live in the part of the neighborhood where sidewalks are proposed. Um, I have, however, and I hope I looked around the room to see if I recognized anybody who has been at those meetings, so I hope I'm not jumping in and um, speaking instead of somebody who lives in that block and has an opinion. Um, maybe I missed some of the conversation, but I don't have any idea what accessibility has to do with it. Um, 
let me, I'm all for accessibility, believe me, but to me the issue is there are several people on the part of Garland and Central Avenue who don't want sidewalks in front of their houses. And so, and from the two neighborhood association meetings I've been to that have been devoted to this, it sounds to me as if the city has decided that they're going to put sidewalks there whether or not the neighbors want them. I think some neighbors probably do want them, but to me the issue is why is this being imposed on us or them because it's not cutting out any of the space in front of my front yard. If, if we do decide we want sidewalks, I'm all for having curb cuts and a width that would accommodate a wheelchair, but anyway, that's all I have to say. Sure. Um, so I, I think that there is an accessibility issue. If you are a person who's in a wheelchair and you have to move around this community um, and you don't have sidewalks, you're in the street. And this is a community that loves speed bumps. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to go over a speed bump in a wheelchair. Um, that would be a solution. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not an accessibility issue. It just means there's a different solution to solving the accessibility issue. Um, so I, you know, I would agree with that. Um, I don't think that the city has said that they're going to, I haven't heard them say that they're going to force sidewalks on Garland Avenue or particular places. Um, what I've heard them say is that uh, we have created a mechanism for people to be able to have sidewalks. I have to tell you that, you know, in the six years that I've been a council member, a lot of people have asked about how they can get, they can get sidewalks in their community. And um, I think I said before when we've talked about Garland that people in Garland in general tell me that they're happy with their street and they don't have a problem with speeding and they don't have other issues. Um, I think it's important to note also that the, um, we're talking about public right-of-way, and so we're talking about public space that belongs to the entire community. As much as the road belongs to the, to the entire community, the public right-of-way that is adjacent to the roadway belongs to the entire community. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not private space. Uh, it's, it's not private land. It, it's community land. And, it, and the, the point about the sidewalks and the accessibility is creating uh, transportation and, and circulation plans. Um, for people to be able to, to move and get about. I don't think that it is going to be functional for the city to force sidewalks on people. Um, I think that if, the, if, I think that what has to happen is that the, the community has to make the determination together. Because if it's, if it's not in the hearts and the minds of the community to be able to provide that to people, then, you know, I don't think that what you end up with then is, is a, a, I don't think that that's positive. I don't think it's a positive change for the community. Um, you know, the, the nation is, the nation is ripe with, with stories of, of cases where the courts have forced changes. In the field of civil rights, where probably most of us would agree it was the right thing to do, um, it created tremendous community conflict. Um, and I, I hope that that's not going to be the case here. And I certainly don't want to, uh, to see sidewalks forced on the community and have it, have it create that kind of a problem. I, I think that what we have to do is be able to have the conversation about it um, and not block the conversation before we even, we even get to having the conversation. Does somebody else want to comment? I think maybe Fred does. <laughs> No, no, I'm just, I uh, want to hear what the, the, the neighbor said. Uh, right my name is Betty Robinson, and I live on Larch, and I don't want sidewalks. I take public transportation. Uh, I don't drive anymore. I'm also a senior citizen. I'm 75 years old. I don't intend on shoveling snow off of anybody's sidewalk, okay? I have been on buses. I've had gentlemen to get off of a bus to help me get off of a bus at 410 at a bus stop where there was a pile of snow. You don't enforce the law as it is on the sidewalks that you have. Or either something is wrong with this town. That snow sat up that high at the bus stop. 
either I had to have someone help me off or the bus had to move to the middle of the street to let me off. You don't enforce the cleaning of those sidewalks on 410, not at all. And a lot of other streets you don't enforce. Also, if they clean the streets of snow, you can remove it. I have had to pay to remove it out of my driveway, and they come right back in and block my driveway. What is that? That doesn't make sense. And it's going to be the same thing if you put sidewalks in. I'm not against sidewalks for wheelchairs. We don't have any people on Large Avenue that have wheelchairs right now. I may be the next one to have one, okay? But that's neither here nor there. I don't want a sidewalk. And that's all I have to say. I have Catherine Tunis, 900 Larch. Um, I, Colleen, I am just so apoplectic at how you behave over this issue. Um, I am a government policy analyst, and I believe very much in government, and it is representative government. So you are here to represent us. You are not here to impose your personal views about sidewalks on us or anyone else. Amen. <laughs> It has nothing to do with accessibility. All our houses have steps up and down the wazoo. There's no way that anyone could, could access those houses while in a wheelchair. Um, I, I just, it, it, it's, it's interesting to me that you keep saying we need to have a conversation when it was been council who has been for years had the conversation on their own without any public input at meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting and how, how you have instructed staff and accepted staff um, uh, studies, supposedly, that did not consider the need for sidewalks. All they did was they didn't look at the streets that really needed sidewalks, which were New Hampshire Avenue and Ethan Allen. They just looked at the side streets which have been without sidewalks for 70 years and don't need them. And we consider it an asset to not have them. And you're saying you want to have a, commu a community discussion, but it hasn't been a community discussion. It has been a sales job. And I feel like when I go to these sidewalk meetings, staff are only saying, oh, it can be this way, it can be that way, it can be this way, and don't worry about anything. But the reality of it is, is the city won't do a damn thing if it's going to have their liability increase. But what about our liability? What about our maintenance costs? You're not considering anything about that. We've had this conversation. This conversation, I want to know, how do we say N-O? And why don't you understand that? Why can't you listen to that? It is not your job to impose your personal views on this community. Um, I think I've probably said enough, but we do have two petitions outstanding that have not been accepted. Council has not said that they will honor them. Um, and I suspect that if you propose sidewalks on any other streets, you may get petitions from those streets as well. I'm surprised that Central Avenue has not submitted one already um, because I've, I've been to those meetings and those people don't want them either. Um, so I would ask the council, the rest of the council members, to please give us some sanity in this process. The lack of sidewalks is an asset to our neighborhood. I chose to live there because there was no sidewalk. A lot of other people did as well. So please help us. I, 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 I apologize, Colleen, that we have such disagreement. Um, I thank you for bringing the cheesecakes. They were fabulous. <laughs> but um, I, I really feel bad about this issue. It is tearing this community apart. I have been bullied. I have been slandered. And so have the other people who have been opposing sidewalks. And that is not a community discussion. That is not bringing the community together. Thank you. Um, Colleen, I'd just like to reply to your reply sure. to my uh, statement. Um, I, I don't I haven't seen a community dialogue. A, a um, city employee showed up at our neighborhood association meeting with drawings, or I don't know if you call them blueprints. I, I'm not an architect or anything. I think anything, they're called 30% designs. 
30 percent design. She, she showed up with a drawing, obviously some money and some time has gone into this, with what this will look like. And I want to know when the dialogue is going to begin, when neighbors will be asked whether or not they want the sidewalks. I mean, why is the city going ahead with plans? I mean, to get a speed bump, you have to, you know, it, it takes months and, and all sorts of petitions and everything. So I don't understand <coughs> why the people who will be directly affected have not been asked if they want sidewalks before any money has been spent drawing up plans. I think that probably Sarah Danes, can, can you, I know Alana's not here, you can't answer that question. All right, so I, let me tell you what I heard from Alana. So, I'm sorry? Where's Daryl? Dar actually, Daryl's not uh, a participant at this point in the Central Avenue sidewalk process. Okay. Um, the Central Avenue sidewalk process emerged from something different from, from the other <coughs> sidewalk activities. It came out of some kind of a safe routes to school, um, a safe routes to school process. And, and this is the best of my understanding. Um, uh, so in about a year ago, the city sent out notices that they were doing this sidewalk activity, and the, um, uh, the residents didn't like the way that the city approached the residents on Central Avenue, and I asked them to pull back a little bit and uh, interact more with the neighborhood association around it. Um, as you're aware, there was a tragedy in the community and um, um, the person who was assuming the role of the president of the neighborhood association um, kind of to regroup some and and since then has, has come <laughs> forth and, and so the neighborhood asso association is more engaged and there's more activity around that. I've been to those meetings just a couple of months ago. Okay. I'm just, this is just the process as I understand it. So, um, Thanks. Then um, I got a notice and was cc'd on some emails between Alana Blanchard and, and John Robinette about uh, set, setting up a meeting. And um, uh, I can't go on Mondays, and I told them that if they wanted the council person present at the meeting that they, they, they couldn't hold it on a, on a Monday because I can't go because it's city council. And I think John and Alana decided to go ahead with that meeting um, uh, in spite of the fact that I, I couldn't be there. They were just going to you know, sort of work it through with the neighborhood association. They had another meeting that I was able to go to, um, which was just a couple of weeks ago on a Thursday. And there were some people here earlier at the reception part of the meeting that had, that had been to that meeting, but I don't see them here now. Um, so. Um, my, you know, my understanding is it's the it's that it's Central Avenue's choice about whether or not they want to have sidewalks. I I talked to Daryl about it. I talked to the city about it. There's no there's no plan to install sidewalks on Central Avenue unless the community comes together and makes a decision about it. I will say that it's um, one of the things, and maybe Councilmember Schultz could talk to this a little bit uh, about the process. Is that this is a learning process for the city and there's a sort of question of do you have to have do you have to have drawings for people to actually talk about what it looks like and visualize it and have the conversation about it which is why they do kind of low level drawings the first at the first take and that's what they've done is kind of a low level first take on central avenue after they've done uh, some kind of a site review and then they go back to the neighborhood and they talk about it and they're like here's kind of, here's what it might look like based on the best available standards and then the neighborhood engages the process as I understand how it worked in Ward 6, then there was a lot of back and forth from the community and the, and the designs themselves changed substantially. But I will tell you that I, I don't believe that any sidewalk is going to be installed on Central Avenue unless the majority of the residents want it. The, uh, since you asked, uh, the, the situation in Ward 6 is different than apparently it's uh, than in Ward 2. Uh, and the reason, well, part there's two reasons. One is that it started out not as a sidewalk discussion. It started out by New Hampshire Gardens, which is the area west of New Hampshire Avenue, between there and Long, Grand Long Branch Park, as a traffic cut-through problem. 
too money too much in the way of commuter traffic using Wildwood and Glenside, the north-south streets that parallel each other, as a, as a shortcut to get around the big intersection at New Hampshire and uh, University. Um, and so the uh, planning staff here responded to sort of talk to us about things that could be done about traffic calming, traffic uh, diversion to keep people from cutting through the neighborhood. In fact, the, uh, the area on the other side of Long Branch, along Garland, uh, there was some effort in that regard as well. Uh, the pl uh, planning staff uh, had meetings with the community, uh, tested some various ideas of, uh, by using rubber cones, temporary signs to see if they could rearrange the one-wayness of certain streets or to get and I don't really know how that all worked out because it really was not my neighborhood. But Alana Blanchard said, well, we can do a similar testing over here. And so they came up after several bunch of meetings with three different plans. Each one was tested for a couple weeks. Observations were made. A traffic, literal traffic engineer was hired to do a traffic count to discern who was drive on the basis of license plates, who was driving, literally driving through the neighborhood as opposed to starting out or ending, you know, as a resident would in the neighborhood. And, and that, that helped. And all this had to do with traffic calming. Then along came the street, the uh, speed cameras. And lo and behold, all of a sudden there was money to actually build sidewalks, which was, uh, basically unprecedented and, and we just never, since there was never any money and the capital budget, then obviously there was no way that we could seriously talk about doing much in the way of sidewalks, whether we liked them or not. So the traffic calming and the sidewalks became a merged issue. And as it turned out, for the most part, people in Ward 6 felt that sidewalks would at least be a safety valve for people who uh, were worried about walking on Wildwood or on Glenside. Glenside's got a lot of dips going through it. Um, and, and so there, the, the plans were adopted eventually, just to make a long story short, for uh, sidewalks on uh, Erskine Street, which goes from New Hampshire over to the city line and the Pinch Georges along Wildwood and some of the little smaller streets that connect to the shopping centers. But that's a different environment, possibly, than what you have in Ward 2. So I'm not here to take sides on what, what should happen in Ward 2. That's your business. I'm just trying to help uh, uh, facilitate the, 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 the discussion. In, in, uh, in our area, I think safety concerns seem to eclipse the environmental concerns. Um, but that could be different in your ward. and so. Um, and, and not every street is getting them, and there's clearly, frankly, there are streets in Ward 6 that there's no business putting a sidewalk, and because they're one block long, they don't go anywhere in particular, and they, can, and they connect two streets, and there's almost no traffic generated because they don't facilitate movement, they just provide a way for people to get to their houses. And, uh, and those people are not asking for sidewalks, and I'm not proposing to the city that they build a sidewalk there. So it's pretty much uh, at this point, we're going to get sidewalks built in fiscal year starting July 1 on certain streets. And then after that, I don't know whether there will ever be any more sidewalks built in Ward 6, but maybe there will be. We'll just have to see how that all works out in, in due time. So that's context for what that might be worth, and it may not be worth much at all. Uh, Josh has a comment. Um, I just want to say that I think this is a hard issue. I mean, obviously a hard issue because the impact for individuals who have the sidewalk right in front of their house is significant. The benefit of sidewalks accrue to potentially, not in all situations, to a larger number of people, people that traverse the street, some people that may not actually live on the street. So that's the, the thing that I think is challenging. There's almost like this positive externality aspect to, to sidewalks um, for people that live in a larger um, area. And so, 
And, and, and I think Colleen said something that was very wise, is that the city is learning in this process. And in some cases, we may have gotten ahead of ourselves in terms of our desire to, to build sidewalks, um, but that there needs to be a process that involves the community. And I don't, I, I've worked with uh, Council Member Clay for a number of years. I think she is very passionate about accessibility and walkability for the community. But I also um, am very clear that I don't think she's going to try and foist sidewalks on anybody. Um, and I think she is trying to construct a conversation. It might not be perfect in every way, um, but that's the intention with the community. And the, and the community might be larger than the people whose um, house the sidewalk will be directly in front of. Um, and I think that it doesn't, it felt a little bit to me like there's an attempt at vilification of uh, come on, Council Member Clay around this issue. And I, I just have to say personally, I don't think that's a productive way to, to have the conversation. So I think we do need to have a conversation. There needs to be a process for community to be involved. Um, but realize that it's a complex issue and that um, every street may be a little different depending on the level of traffic, both of cars and people, the, the institutions that um, a street might, might or might not provide accessibility to. And I agree with you completely that, uh, uh, that the, the tool design study wasn't rigorous in all those ways. Um, you know, as I looked at it more closely, uh, the balance of, uh, of the numbers or how things were, were weighted were a little bit off. Um, and I think there was too much weight given to how easily a sidewalk could be built, how low cost it would be versus how much it would really drive increased accessibility to institutions. But that's part of the learning process. Um, and you know, I think uh, uh, Council Member Clay is trying to do the best job possible to hear all voices in the community and engage people with that. Thank you, Josh. Um, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask um, if there are others in the community um, or anyone in the community here who want to talk about other, have other questions or other issues they want to raise. I want to make sure you get a chance to be heard, too. Sidewalks, but I That's do have fine. some questions. Uh, my name is Kate, and I live on March Avenue, <clears throat> but I'm on the section of Larch between New Hampshire and Elm. Okay, you come off New Hampshire, you go immediately down, and then you go immediately up. If you are in a wheelchair, sidewalks not going to help you. You're not going to be able to get up that hill. My mother lived half her life in a wheelchair, and I was the designated driver. And her her community didn't have sidewalks, but the accessibility from the street to her house was my responsibility. And we put it in and everything was fine. But our streets are so hilly, our houses are on hills, there's steps everywhere. And I've had a lot of experience with wheelchairs and with accessibility. And that section of Larch, it just, I don't think it needs it. When I moved into the neighborhood, I was considered the young family. Now I'm second oldest on the block. My kids, had they had sidewalks, would have been tearing up and down on skates and skateboards. And that, that section is extremely dangerous. I mean, it, it doesn't bode well for sidewalks, period. And then my other, my other thing is, um, you know, I was talking to my neighbors about how, you know, it was like a community thing when it snowed because we'd all be out there digging our cars out. And it doesn't happen very often. We don't get that much snow in this area. But I certainly don't want to have to be responsible for a sidewalk because now that my kids are gone, I don't shovel. I just walk through the snow because I don't have to. And I don't want to have to shovel for somebody else. And besides that, it's such a hill that when I've been stuck and couldn't get down my own street, as several of my other neighbors, we walk down the grass. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even try to walk down the street. So, you know. That being said, um, but my question would be: Larch, that section of Larch is very narrow. It's parking one side only, not my side, unfortunately. So when my kids were small, it was walking them back and forth across the street. I would have loved to have been able to park in front of my house, but I couldn't. So now you're going to put sidewalks in. Does that eat up my yard? Or is that going to shrink my street? And what side of the street are you going to put it in on? 
my yard's not that big. And you're going to take three more feet away from me, four more feet away? I mean, as far as, I know it's not mine, but you know what I mean. Yeah, and then, you know, that shrinks my yard. But then if it's going to go out into the street at all, you're, you're shrinking my street. And it's hard to navigate now, but just parking on one side. So I don't know about, now, as far as accessibility, um, Carroll Avenue, Elm, um, you know, those are flat. And I could see a, a, a sidewalk and, and wheelchairs. But on my particular block, I think it's just completely unnecessary. Not to mention the fact that it's an old neighborhood. There's trees, there's bushes, and all that is going to be torn out. And a lot of us have, you know, foliage and whatnot that goes almost right down to the curb. So environmentally, you're knocking out a bunch of neat stuff to put in concrete. So anyway, that's my opinion. I appreciate the details of your, your particular street. Um, it's a reminder for me to go walk on it because I haven't been walked on Larch uh, or run on it. I run down Elm occasionally over to Sligo. That's because it's flat. No, I like to go up and down hills. It's good for your health. Um, the, 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 the thing I did want to point out, I'm not disagreeing with any of those points, and that might be the right, to, you know, right input uh, around the sidewalk. I do want to point out something, though, that accessibility is not just about wheelchairs. Right, so there's issues of people being blind, uh, which with side, sidewalks make them much easier to walk on. People having other disabilities that wouldn't require, physical disabilities that wouldn't require you to be in a wheelchair, um, that sidewalks make it easier for. If someone uh, is deaf, it's generally safer to walk on a sidewalk than in the street because you can't hear, hear the car. So I just bring that up, not to say that that's a justification for why sidewalks should be on large or any street, but just that we should think about the totality of of the um, the accessibility and disability issues that are connected to sidewalks. It's not only about, about wheelchairs. So I just wanted to raise that issue. Okay, I just want to say one more thing. <laughs> please, um, please come to the microphone I'm before coming, you I'm talk coming. so we can um, all hear you. Crap. And you made me forget what I was going to say. You were talking about um, blind and um, handicapped. Okay, first of all, if you have a family member or a child with that type of a disability, you wouldn't move into my neighborhood anyway. There's too many steps. There's too many hills. You know, you would consider that. That would be definitely a factor. But I don't think putting a, a sidewalk on my block is going to help a blind person or someone with a disability, and I don't think it's going to encourage them to want to move into that area because I would of the I stairs. Would and I would hills. reiterate that I wasn't making it as a justification for putting sidewalks on Larch Avenue. All I was okay. saying was I heard a lot about wheelchairs, and I just wanted people right. to be aware of and acknowledge the fact that there's a variety of disabilities. Oh, that, I agree. That, I'm that, just talking about my street. Okay. My street. That's, yeah. that's it. There's, there's a deaf family that lives right around the corner from me, and I live on Hayward, which is uh, at quite a slope. and. Um, I've lived there for seven years, but within the last few years, there have been two people there in wheelchairs that, that, that have lived in the in the community, even in spite of the hills. Yes, Mr. Gill. Hi. Uh, I, I think I hadn't thought about much about the uh, accessibility issues, but I certainly am willing to learn about them in terms of this dialogue. I work for a federal agency on these sorts of issues in terms of environmental protection and stormwater management. And I un and I miss I understand councilman's rights issues about having a process, and I agree with that we need a transparent process that formalizes what are the criteria that we're going to look at in terms of whether the sidewalk is is, is a, a necessary um, part of the city and on our culture. But I think we need to look at a number of factors, both safety, accessibility. I've never heard, heard the liability issue brought up. In, our, in discussions with our smart growth people at the agency I work with. So we need to do some analysis because I know communities are being built now, uh, new communities without sidewalks and without curbs and gutters using environmentally sensitive designs. So the question is whether there is a liability issue and how that might affect our community. And so you need to use these factors, both the environmental factors, uh, the social factors, the, the need for, for access, transport, uh, thoroughfare, uh, passage um, and, and look at the, the design of the system 
on a systematic basis in the city and, and determine whether the, the street can be used as a, a mostly multimodal transportation thoroughfare with the safety of all the potential users in mind. And perhaps the sidewalks are indicated, but as some people have said, some, you get compartmentalization, you have uh, segmented sidewalks that don't serve much purpose. So you have to make some sense out of when does a sidewalk make sense and, and in what circumstances would it make sense and do you need one on one side of the street or another or can it switch back and forth or can the street serve as that access point? Sure. Okay. I'd like to make another point in that I see this disturbing trend around municipalities around the country in that there's this idea that more development is better and, and a lot of communities are doing because they think they're going to get tax revenues and it's, I'm using this as an analogy to looking at uh, communities including Washington DC that are trying to be green and they're putting in sidewalks and curbs where I don't really see the need for them and and, and so one thing the city might want to consider what are the fiscal implications of putting in infrastructure that has to be maintained in perpetuity okay each sidewalk is many cubic yards of permeable or non-permeable concrete asphalt uh, other other materials those have to be extracted from the, the natural resources that they come from. There's a carbon footprint for every cubic yard of concrete and then there's a carbon footprint for constructing, maintaining, and rehabilitating those systems over time. So the question is, where does the city want to put itself if, if say, we were to decide as a community to expand our, our sidewalk frame, uh, infrastructure 20%, does that put a 20% higher burden on our, 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 our resources and can we afford that and is that the best use of our, our resources. So uh, those are some of the things I like to consider. And the other thing is, we are now ha we're known as a tree city. And so what I see around the country is when they put in sidewalks, they often don't leave enough space for the trees. And so you're, there are techniques where you can preserve the trees, but they're very expensive and, and labor intensive. But what happens is the tree, the, the, the critical root zone gets impacted and the trees die. So you lose mature, um, tree canopy that we're trying to pr promote and, and, and um, expand in our, our city. So the question is, can you have sidewalks and mature trees? They're not exclusive of each other, but you have to make a concerted design decision to have uh, enough area, we call them expanded tree boxes, so that mature trees can grow and they're not constrained by concrete on one side, the curb on the other, and the utility work that also occurs on top of all of this. So th those are just some things I'd like you to consider. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to engage in this dialogue in the future. Great. I, I, uh, I really appreciate your comments. And um, I think if there was a place to have that conversation, that Tacoma Park is, is the place to have it. This is off the topic of sidewalks, but I was wondering if there was, uh, if um, there could be a basketball hoop in um, Sligo Creek Park, because there's already a court there, and I'm starting to play basketball, and I would really like a uh, place to practice. And there was a hoop there. I don't know what happened to it, but it's not there anymore, and I would like to practice somewhere close. I am ever. Well, hold, hold on a second. I. I am ever so close to an answer for you. I was hoping I would have an answer before tonight, but I, I, I didn't get the entire answer back yet. But, but I'm closer. Um, this was brought up by um, another gentleman in, uh, in Ward, Ward 2 in Long Branch, Sligo on the 18th of March. And um, I've actually been dogging an answer to this since then. And I've, I've heard all kinds of things. For a while, I was convinced that they had decided not to put in, uh, not to replace the basketball hoop. That, uh, that they had removed when they were redoing the playground. But I learned today that, in fact, the, the park's uh, folks from the county are going to replace the basketball hoop. So I know that for a fact. They are going to replace it. Um, it apparently, they, uh, they had put it on their list, and they are going to replace it soon. And I thought today they were actually going to give me an actual date of when they were going to replace it, but I'm, I'm sad to say that I didn't quite make it to the deadline tonight. However, the basketball backboard and hoop are coming, and when I get an actual date, I will I will post it to the listserv and let you, your folks your folks can tell you about it. Okay, thank you. Dan, do you have a quick comment? My comments on the sidewalk. I don't know if I should wait until all the sidewalk um, <laughs> comments are over or if I should throw it in now. So uh, I'll wait. Why don't you wait? You can perfect it. 
Yeah. <laughs> My name is Lori Chakudi, and I live on Ethan Allen. Um, and I have some questions that are not related to sidewalks. Um, so one question that I have is about uh, the city's relationship with the State Highway Administration, which is something we've heard a lot about. <laughs> maybe not worse. Good. Maybe a worse topic than sidewalks. Right. <laughs> See if we could do that. Um, you know, and I. Uh, sort of it, it baffles me that it could be as bad as it appears to be. Uh, and I'm wondering um, what kinds of proactive steps can be taken. And I'm not talking specifically about Ethan Allen right now. Um, I'm on the Junction Task Force, and I have to tell you that when, you know, the Junction Task Force meets um, every other week, and then the subcommittees meet another week, and um, so as uh, I'm running off to my, I don't know, 12th meeting, which was only in the second month of the, the whole endeavor, my husband said, how many times can you all get together and talk about the street lights? Yeah. And I assured him, oh, no, that's not all we were ever going to talk about. There were so many other things that one could do at the junction, but it appears that one could actually talk about the street lights for an entire year um, and, and still not figure out, you know, how to get the SHA to, to have a conversation with you. Um, so I'm not, I'm not specifically asking about the junction, and I'm not specifically asking about Ethan Allen, but it seems like they're, I, I'm curious about the, the nature of the relationship um, and then, uh, you know, just in terms of getting anything dealt with. Uh, I remember at one meeting of the Junction Task Force, we asked about, you know, how do we get a crosswalk from sort of the, the one place that doesn't have a crosswalk from sort of the parking lot to the, the former TJs, and we were told by the city staff who was there that she had heard three different answers and didn't know how to get the right answer. Um, and so it just it seems like it's a significant enough relationship that we got to work on it, and maybe we got to work on it in you know context with MML or yeah, with our state delegation. And I'm uh, and maybe you know, if, if it's a really long answer, and I mean I'm curious if, if you can say something about it, anyone on staff or, or whoever, um, or I'd be interested in a you know longer conversation about it. But I, it seems like something that's worth putting significant energy in over the long term to develop a good relationship because it really it has a lot of implications throughout the city. I have other questions, so I'll, I don't know if you can answer that now or should I go on to my other topic? Well, it's, there's, there's not a simple answer to that I, question. I suspect there's not. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's some, at times it feels like it's an exercise in banging your head against a brick wall. Um, I've learned a lot of different things about the State Highway Administration. Uh, one of the things I've learned about them is that uh, they, they do things um, from sort of their count, county central districts. Um, and so one of the ways that you can be more successful is to get the county, the county central district to prioritize your project. Um, I think that our public works director and our, our uh, deputy city administrator probably have the closest ties to the SHA relationship and I don't see either of them uh, sitting in the auditorium right now. I don't know where they're at. Um, so I will say that um, for me the process of going through the, the 410 piece and um, I think initially I was probably more engaged in it uh, than the other council members and then um, the mayor really kind of assumed more uh, of a of a lead role on that. Uh, that they're they're more responsive to the you know to the mayor, and I know that he spent a lot of time uh, working with SHA around the issue of trying to get funding for the 410 route. And the the timing of the streetlight in question predates me on the council, and I've been on the council for six years. Um, yeah. And uh, from as far as maybe Terry might have more mm -hmm. information about it. Um, but but the you know there the issue is as I understand it the the state won't update the lights the lighting system and the and the county won't take over controls which would allow us to sync the lights across 410 until the state updates the controls and I can't remember the reason why the state won't update the controls no I can't remember either but. The, I think um, the city manager went to go get um, the public works director and the deputy city administrator. So maybe we, they can give you some more insight on that question before you. I, I think it's just a, a broader request from the community to you know make that relationship a priority. Well, I think there's been some significant prioritization of that relationship and some in, in investment in 
relationships with people both at this sort of county level where some of the decisions are made as well as at the state level. I'm sad to say that Neil Peterson uh, is is no longer going to be the SHA uh, administration director. Um, I was really disappointed when I got that email because here we've spent a year educating him about the issue and he, he resigns. Um, Maybe that's why. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm sure it was because uh, I talked to him. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Suzanne, the, the question on the on the table is about um, building positive relationships with the state highway administration and Effective why relationships it is such a a struggle to get responses, particularly around issues like the crosswalk at the junction and timing the lights and you know working with them over permitting and all, all of the different issues that we've had with them. Well, I, th I think in general, um, the folks are personally very responsive um, and do want to assist us when when there's questions. Um, they're good people and they have um, regulations that are very close to what our community wants in terms of, of safety and kind of specifications. Uh, sometimes there's I think the biggest issue is funding for State Highway. And if it's not in the pot that they have available at the time, you never know when something might be able to, to happen. Um, you raised the question about the um, updating of the traffic signals. And that's one of those situations where it's very expensive to do the kind of this computer electronics work underneath the, the underneath the underneath the street, oh, okay. um, and to to bring them to the kind of standards that are needed to interact with the other systems. And while they're doing that on New Hampshire right now, uh, and have done that in some sections of New Hampshire, the other stuff that was done with stimulus funds, so they had those funds for that segment. Other kinds of things, we have no clue when that when that might occur. Um, you're right. I think it's going to be a little awkward when uh, that Neil Peterson is leaving. Nevertheless, the person who will be you know, the interim administrator is Daryl Mobley, who we worked with for years as the District 3 engineer. And so we've already got a nice relationship with him that we can fall back on. We don't have to learn a new person, at least as an interim administrator. Um, you know, I think... Part of this is just, like I said, I think it's just kind of figuring out what what priorities we have and how that matches their funding. Um, other things just take time. Anytime it's a big infrastructure issue, um, it always takes longer than you think. <laughs> you just try to try to figure out how many how many months the the scheduling takes and whatever, and that's frustrating. For some of the things like uh, the actual crosswalks and that timing, Alana. In, in the housing office has that information down and I, I don't know the answers to that but uh, there is a whole series of, of explanation to that one that I don't I don't know okay I'm not sure if that's if that helps you but I, I at least I do feel that we have on a personal level a good working relationship and the opportunity to reach people when we need to reach them where that goes in terms of getting what the community wants done at a time they want done is, is a different matter I wanted to, to touch on something else, so it's okay, I'll just shift to that now. Um, uh, I was interested in, I wanted to encourage the council to consider thinking about um, food policy and uh, specifically local food policy and healthy food policy and it uh, generally is not something I think that's considered and discussed by council, although I do appreciate the funding the council is consistently given to Crossroads Market. Um, but I think that there is a lot of work, you know, we have a, a federal government that is uh, subsidizing all of the unhealthy food that then creates diabetes, that then creates a health care crisis that we wonder why we can't bring the cost down on and then we're trying to figure out how to solve that problem. So with, with that sort of as the, the behemoth of the, you know, the food policy at the federal level, it seems that it's appropriate to have food policy at a local level that maybe starts to combat that um, and that could also have a um, local benefit of being a you know local um, driver of, of local of the local economy um, and so uh, some of the things um, you know that that could 
be tied to that. First, let me thank you for getting pizza that has the local farmer's market apples on it. Um, <laughs> okay. So certainly every every council board night ought to have that. But but related to that, you know, I think there is there is food purchases that the city makes. And so the possibility of prioritizing local food in, um, in those purchases as much as, as possible. Um, there uh, are education possibilities through um, uh, uh, the rec department with, with young people as well as with all ages. Um, there's access issues, and I understand that the Crossroads um, market ha rents the city's a van um, for, the, for the, um, the, the run from um, several of the apartments in the senior building to Crossroads market. It seems that that could be expanded to something of a circulator and maybe um, I'm totally transparent. I'm affiliated with the, with the co-op as well, but it, there's a lot of local food produced and, and sold there and healthy food and you know, some kind of a, of a circulator that brings people closer physically um, to where there is both healthy and, and local food. Um, and then also just thinking about our, uh, our parks and the, um, the property that the city owns and the possibility of edible landscapes, you know, within those that can be both attractive and, and support, you know, very local food production and education. And um, I'm very excited about the one uh, right down here, wherever it is underneath us somewhere. Um, and then, you know, the possibility of using um, economic development funds to support really micro-enterprise development. And so I've been in conversations with Crossroads about the community kitchen idea and supporting people to take the funds, uh, you know, to take the food that's, that's grown locally and, you know, use it as job training and then, you know, produce more food locally. And it seems that there's, I mean, there's a lot of possible directions and a lot that really can be done at a, at a city council level in terms of food policy. Um, so I would, uh, and, uh, you know, there are some, cities now that have food councils that support, you know, because we don't have enough committees, um, we don't have enough task forces, so that's one that you can think of when you're trying to think of another task force. But seriously, there's, there's food councils that um, sort of support and guide the city's policies on that. So I wanted to um, make that suggestion. And there's one last thing. I wasn't going to say anything about sidewalks, but I feel like I need to say uh, a few quick things. Um, first of all, it's unusual for me not to feel passionate about an issue because on most issues I feel incredibly passionate and sidewalks happens to be one that I don't, um, that I feel like I can see really everyone's or a lot of perspectives on it. And what's been important to me about sidewalks is that all voices be heard and that issue has come up. I worked with Saska to develop the survey with the hopes of creating space for all voices to be heard. Um, and what we found in the survey was I think um, that that people are divided, that there are lots of people, and I think you've heard from a lot of them tonight, who feel very passionately against sidewalks, and there are people who do want sidewalks in their community, and there's a split um, and uh, high standard deviation, which kind of highlights the split. I mean, people are sort of on one end or the other of that. Um, and it, it seems to me that um, when there is kind of this um, sidewalk versus no sidewalk uh, place that we're at, um, it could be important to step back out of the yes or no dialogue um, and into a conversation about the values and then thinking more broadly about how those values get met. And so the values that, you know, are about safety, um, pedestrian and bike friendliness, accessibility and inclusion of all people in the community and protecting the environment, and that, there's probably others that I'm missing. But it seems like if we step back and say, okay, so these are our values, and then um, I actually think that really looking at the communities that we're looking at more broadly, and instead of saying, should we put a sidewalk here or not, really asking about traffic flow and safety and what are all the ways we make those safe. And sidewalks may be part of that, part of the solution, but it may be that there's other pieces um, to the solution uh, as well. And if we have that broader conversation about how do we accomplish all these goals in these communities, we may be more likely to reach something closer to consensus. Everyone might not still be happy, but we may be more likely to reach some consensus about that broader design stuff than if we kind of keep it in the yes versus no place. And I've taken up a lot of time, so thank you. So uh, uh, someone should know also that Laura's uh, career field is as a mediator, so she has some experience with that. <laughs> um, I just want to say that um, I've actually been uh, trying to develop some interest in the city in doing something with the youth around uh, grow, uh, having a garden where they're able to use their gardens in food products because it's something that I did in my year as an AmeriCorps member. Um, I worked with a, a public housing community and my part of my project for the three months was to 
uh, we bottled uh, white wine vinegars and sold them at the local uh, Shishi Co-op-esque market. Um, and uh, the kids ran a business out of it. It's something I'd love to see our recreation department and other folks collaborate on because it's a great activity uh, for the kids. There's all kinds of things besides growing. They get to um, do marketing and um, bottling and production and all kinds of things. And so um, I would be very happy to uh, see some other interests and parts of other members of the community to help uh, roll that along. I've also been uh, talking to someone in the community also about a commercial uh, kitchen in a, in a kitchen that already exists, um, which, would be, which would be great as well. So maybe we should talk some more about that. Um. Councilmember uh, Robinson had a comment you wanted to make. Yeah, I, I wanted to say a couple things about the sidewalks, um, and I think it's a good. Uh, there's been a lot of um, wise words spoken here tonight on on both sides and all sides, and a lot of passion, which is which is good. Um, there's I, I'm I'm sensitive to the ADA requirements and the and the things, but I think there's some fears, there's some heavy fears that are out kind of floating around, and that's a good thing to back back away from so that we can kind of think about them. Um, we were When we were presented on the council with the tool study, which was a study of sidewalks in the city, there was a fear that we would never be able to afford sidewalks because the price tag was $40 million. And I know that my jaw dropped um, big time. I thought, well, this will never happen. Um, there's um, fear of speed on our streets. And a lot of people are saying, well, let's just slow the traffic down. And I think that's a worthwhile goal. Let's just slow the traffic down. Instead of building our way out, I think those were some good points about you can't always build your way out of a problem. Um, there's a fear of the environmental impact with concrete being, as I understand it, the worst polluter, the worst uh, building, putting concrete in is the worst thing you can do. Not only from the uh, amount of stuff that goes in the air, CO2, but also from the stormwater that goes off. And then there's the trees. Um, so these are all fears. Um, there's the fiscal reality, which I alluded to with the $40 million price tag. And, um, and, and yet we have had a, a genuine evolution of the discussion about sidewalks, and I think that's been very good because uh, we've, um, we've started uh, with that tool uh, report and moved along, moved a long ways, and I, I think that's, that's very good. Um, and it, what's, what's very important also is to have the democratic outreach, to reach out to people. So um, I'm, I'm learning as we go as well. Uh, I'm not interested in doing things that people don't want unless there's a really good reason to do it. And if people on the streets don't want it, I, my, I tend to say, you know, don't put a sidewalk there unless there's a really good reason to do it. Uh, we on the council have to recognize what's a, uh, what's a good reason. And in a reverse kind of scenario, for years, we've always put in speed bumps because people want them. And now we're starting to consider up here, well, when won't we allow a speed bump? So it's kind of the reverse of when will we allow a sidewalk. And we won't allow a speed bump if the street's too steep or if, um, if you can't see properly. And there's a whole lot of other factors. So all that's to say that it's a complicated issue. Um, right now, I, if it was a vote, I would vote in general to be very to have great restraint on putting on spending money and putting in concrete but not to say I would never allow a, a sidewalk anywhere particularly if people didn't want it or people did want it um, I was hoping we could continue with um, public comment here so we can receive it Good evening. My name is Colia Braun Greiner. I live on Central Avenue, and I'm also the mother of the younger citizen that spoke earlier, named Sophia. Um, I, I bring a, a, not a hot button issue as sidewalks. Um, I enjoy uh, immensely walking on Sligo Creek Trail almost on a daily basis as part of my exercise. And I really love the beauty of it. And occasionally, uh, the beauty is marred by some trash that someone has thrown on the side of the trail. And I always notice it around the area around Carroll uh, Avenue Bridge or in that region, which happens to be about the farthest away from either the trash can at the park at North Sligo Creek Park or the next trash can that I've observed which is at the next park beyond Maple 
and um, I'm just wondering if it would be possible to have uh, trash cans placed um, either one at Maple Avenue, that would be ideal, so that people would have more incentive to carry their trash to, to a closer trash can. And it seems like the trash cans are really quite far apart and wondering if what could be done about that. The trail is obviously managed by park and planning. Um, I'd be happy to follow up with their maintenance folks and just relay your concerns. Is there another location besides Maple Avenue that you have interest in? Well, that was the suggest I suggested that because it would probably be the easiest for a sanitation truck to just, you know, swing by there rather than driving down the trail. Um, but at least that would be a like, midpoint between the two existing ones that I'm aware of at this point. So, can yeah. I, can I just respond because I know something about this? Um, there was a trash can at Maple. Can you, can you tell us? Your oh, I'm sorry. I'm Sally Tabor. I live on Auburn Avenue. I'm also the president of Saska, the South of Sligo Citizens Association. And in our neighborhood association has worked on park issues and particularly trail issues in the last several years, um, on and off. Um, the, um, the park system took the trash cans all away for a very short period of time until there was a great hellabaloo. And there was one at Maple. In fact, I think there was one halfway there. There was one maybe near Jackson Avenue because we had asked for them to be near major exit points um, so that um, dog owners in particular would sort of drop their little presents in a trash can. And I know when they came back, they never put one back at Maple. And in fact, there used to be a picnic table up there. there I don't think it's still there. And, and it seems like a reasonable place to put one. So, yes. Are there other folks? Hi, this is Catherine. I just wanted to follow up on a comment that Lorig and Dan made about um, the several conversation, I won't repeat things, but um, something that did come out of the conversations that we've had in Ward 2, the Central Avenue meetings, as well as Ward 6 meetings, has been the concept of lowering the speed limit. And, and please don't hold me to this, but if I remember correctly, the speed limit in Tacoma Park is 30 miles an hour unless otherwise posted. Um, it is... It, it, the city law says 25 miles an hour, but that doesn't become effective unless if it's posted. And still, if you drive on our side streets, 25 miles an hour feels like you're, you know, you may as well be on the Audubon for our side streets, and that is not safe. Um, and so the discussion has been, and this consensus that people have come to, that people can agree to, is that we ought to lower our speed limits that it would be fairly easy for the council to lower the speed limits to 20 or even 15 and post it. And that would be a lot less environmentally damaging to create signs and post it. And that would allow, you know, one, it would give notice that, you know, the speed limit is only 15 or 17 or 20 or whatever you decide. Um, but it would just make it easier that when people are doing 30, that they could, there could be some enforcement. Um, I'll say that I suggested that starting about four years ago uh, when Long Branch LIGO was looking at traffic calming and then also I think we talked about it at, at one of the SASCA meetings, um, it landed at the council with the big thud and little interest and there wasn't that much interest in the community at the time but over, over time as people have been addressing the dish, different issues I think there's a renewed interest in the possibility of a 15 or 20 mile per hour speed limit in the city. Uh, council member Wright, uh, comment? I just uh, wanted to add something related to the state highway. But I do think that we have to both use our county and state delegations to pressure the state highway around specific things we want. But I think it's also uh, just good to be aware of kind of the nature of the beast. And that kind of, I think, probably contributes to the problem of us not getting as much service as we want, which is that when you think about what state highway does, and what the majority of the, the vast majority of the roads and the situations they deal with, um, and also kind of how they're measured, 99%, maybe not 99, but 95% of that does not look like Tacoma Park, right? So it's not, most state highways are not going through
places that are have our level of density with pedestrians and that and that sort of stuff. Um, and so that the nature of the beast thinks about all those places where it's basically about blacktop and cars zooming along quickly, um, and not about uh, the more complex situations like we have here. That's not to say we shouldn't push them. We should push them, but I think that is part of the problem that they're thinking the majority of the time about that and they're thinking about moving cars along roads. Like I can remember when we were had a proposal and have talked about changing New Hampshire Avenue to more of a a uh, uh, like an avenue style setup where there's a main central road and two side roads. You know, the, a lot of the response we got back from State Highway was we move X number of cars through that area um, per day and we anticipate the volume increasing and that's what they're really focused on. Um, so just to be aware of that, that's the nature of what the beast is dealing and that probably drives a lot of the culture and what they're focused on. And the way we have to fight against that is kind of using our very effective delegate, uh, District 20 delegation and the, and the county to get specific things that we want. So if we want it to be a priority that we're going to change the, the signals at the, uh, at the junction, based on something that the task force recommends, we have to make that a singular issue for a while with those people and, 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 and push it. Are there other folks? Juan Luis Torres, 900 Elm Avenue, uh, just around the corner. In reference to your last statement, I have learned that State Highway does not move until the elected officials show up. Um, we have a similar situation in reference to an intersection at Columbia Park Road or Chevrolet Avenue in Tuxedo. Until the people from Annapolis uh, were bothered a little bit, Stay Highway didn't show up. And uh, as soon as we bothered them sufficiently, um, they made the necessary changes to our intersection. So I encourage you to continue to, I don't want to say the word pester them, but sort of encourage them verbally in as many as many ways as you can. I'm here on behalf of myself, uh, the residents at um, 800 Elm Avenue, that is the Morales family, uh, Melissa Klein, uh, my neighbor next door, 900 Elm Avenue, and uh, 902 Elm Avenue. And for all the reasons that have been given previously, environmental reasons, the issues related to we don't want the sidewalks in front of our street, I am here to let you know that really the residents of the 900 block have no interest whatsoever on having sidewalks. The street is sufficiently calm with the speed homes that were placed in there. We signed for that and we encourage them and these people do not mind using the sidewalk. We have people running all the time on Elm Avenue and uh, it is a very peaceful environment to run. Uh, my children played on that street without any challenges whatsoever. But I've noticed that the residents that are in that street, those that have lived there for quite some time, their hair has gotten a little grayer at this time. And I used to be the young guy that moved there in 19... I'm sorry. <laughs> um, at some point, uh, my hair was to be totally black. and. Uh, for some reason or another, I know that I'm a public works director and that tends to bring your hair a little grayish, but, um, uh, I'm sorry? <laughs> um, but anyway, I just want to let you know that we really, uh, we love Cy, which we, and um, in reference to the issue of in, encompassing and bringing people together, uh, my first job was as a race relations officer for the U.S. Army. I know what it means to include people. I didn't know that I wasn't included because as a Puerto Rican I included everybody in the neighborhood, but I didn't, that did not happen in America for some reason. But uh, I fully understand your needs and, and the reality of those individuals that, uh, that have accessibility issues. And yet, it hasn't been a problem in 22 years that I have lived in the same house. Uh, is that correct? 30. Okay. I'm sorry for my audience, but uh, <laughs> so as you can see, actually, the only person uh, that so far has spoken on behalf, and I know there is another individual right here who will in a couple of minutes on behalf of sidewalks, but the reality is that they're not really environmentally good, and I don't want to, re you know, reiterate what has been told, but now the residents don't want it. 
And so, please, let's pay attention to the residents at this time. Please, thank you. Anyone else? Joe Edgel, 1001L. Quick question, actually, um, since we're talking about the uh, state highways, what are, whatever became of the charrette that the city and city residents and uh, planners put so much effort into, and that seems to have kind of died, and the city doesn't seem to be pushing that effort, of which would seem to really improve a lot of these issues that we the talked about. about New Hampshire, New Hampshire Avenue? Avenue? Yeah. The, the short hasn't died. The the I know the, uh, the planning uh, staff working on it. The but planning but staff utilize it all the time. It's <laughs> it was probably yeah. the you know the the impetus and the core of a lot of activities that are happening in the New Hampshire Avenue corridor. You see the New Hampshire Avenue uh, marketing campaign. You see organizing around the businesses that are there. Um, you see, I think, continued work with State Highway around some of the uh, safety issues of the sidewalks that exist there because there are all kinds of boxes and things around them. Um, you've seen it come up when, um, once the charrette was done, mostly you're talking about the changes that happen as the property sell. Uh, yeah, well, well, what side. I'm really talking about, actually, calling is more the State Highway portions. Um, they've spent a lot of money on repaving and putting in new curbs and things like that, and it just seems a lot less likely that they'll make the larger changes which were recommended by the city and the planning staff that require state highway buy-in. Obviously, the business stuff, I understand sure. that um, this is still going the, the, uh, the plan that the Charette came back with, which is um, what you know they call a Great Streets plan, which reduced the lanes from three lanes to two lanes on each side, but um, created pullouts for um, buses and other things so that you uh, you had slower. There was a third lane, but it was uh, dedicated to, to slower, slower traffic adjacent to the businesses um, and public transportation support. That's a really hard sell in in Maryland, and we knew when the charrette happened that you know that wasn't going to happen in a couple of years. The um, the the um, the resurfacing that happened also happened in the Montgomery County section and not in the Prince George's uh, section. And to it's, 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 it's a long-term plan because you're going you're, you're gonna to have to change the way the State Highway does business to get them to, to work that. That's, that's a long-term process. But the, the subcomponents of it continue to move forward around you know, turning the businesses to the, to the street, putting the parking behind, a lot of the other things that help that uh, along with it in mind that we would like to move in that direction. Uh, Sarah, do you have more to say about that? The other thing that um, came out of the design or the shred for the New Hampshire Avenue was that the multi-way um, boulevard, which Clean is referred to, um, was incorporated in the sector plan for the Tacoma Langley crossroads areas as well. So we started it on one end and it moved its way north. Um, speaking on behalf of my staff and others, we continue to lobby for the development of a multi-way boulevard, uh, the creation of on-road bike trail or bike paths, trails, um, lanes, lanes is the right word, um, as well as additional sidewalks and things like that. So as Colleen has indicated, it's a very long process, it's a very quiet process, but gradually as we continue to have these conversations with developers that are interested in the areas, property owners that are looking at ways that they can improve their property, as well as the planning staff, the elected officials on both Montgomery County and Prince George's side, as well as officials from State Highway, we're very slowly working our way into uh, this might not be a bad idea after all kind of thing. But it is. it would be a very expensive proposition. And this is how I learned about the different segments of the um, of the state highway was when we first started doing some lobbying around New Hampshire Avenue. The portion of New Hampshire Avenue that runs between East West Highway and Eastern Avenue is that roadway is actually owned by Prince George's County and is therefore controlled by the Prince George's County section of the State Highway Administration who has little interest in that portion of the road, whereas the part of the, I know, 
bang your head against a brick wall. Um, the part of the road that runs between 410 and University uh, is Montgomery County, who, who did invest in it and chose to use their stimulus uh, recovery act money, whatever you would call it, to repave that part of the road. The, the only thing that I would add to this whole discussion, which is uh, the, the irony to me, is the state highways, as I think Councilmember Wright mentioned, is interested in moving traffic, and I think that's right. But the irony is the traffic which moves from, say, the Langley Crossroads area to the Eastern Avenue area, for the most part, doesn't stop in that area. They're moving into the city, and as soon as they hit Eastern Avenue, they go to two lanes on each side. So, in fact, a, a four-lane boulevard with the slow lane, the third slow lane for six lanes on the outside, would work just fine. It would be very consistent with what exists going into D.C. now. So well, uh, and that obviously is lost on the state highways, I assume. Well, no, actually, I think that right. it is they're recognizing that. That's the exact argument that the city has been putting forth, and I think that they are coming to recognize that very Good, argument. Great. Thanks. Anyone else? I apologize if this is a little bit off topic because it's a, a couple of questions for things slightly <laughs> outside of War II, but that we have interest in and have worked on in the past. Um, uh, well, one thing is in War II, and that is that State Highway has, during Snowmageddon, which hopefully won't happen too often, too many times a century, um, but that State Highway, in order to facilitate cars moving by faster, made all of our sidewalks on New Hampshire Avenue impassable so that I had to beg one of my neighbors to dig out her four-wheel drive vehicle to take another neighbor to the shoppers to get her prescription because we couldn't walk safely. Um, so if the city could have some influence on State Highway during snowstorms and to let them know that pedestrian safety on New Hampshire Avenue is important. Um, but outside of, um, of uh, War II, there's Cat a couple Catherine. of properties. I'm oh, sorry. We will have a public comment period. We are trying to stick to Ward 2 night things like right that. now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's 9 o'clock already, you know. I'd rather let folks from Ward 2 have their input. Hi, good evening. My name is Renee, and I live on Auburn Avenue. and. Um, my main concern is actually the crime that occurs over, uh, I guess, just around the corner on Auburn. There's a hair cuttery place, or not hair cuttery, but they, I don't know what they're, cut creations, I think, and um, some other businesses, and they've had um, robberies. And I would like the police chief and other people to note um, that it, maybe it would be good to have a little more police presence in the area also at the Sunoco station across the street. It's not as serious, but people, I guess, while people are inside, go into people's cars and take items. And that's that kind of ties into the sidewalks. I, I just feel like sidewalks invite foot traffic, and that would kind of um, unnecessarily uh, bring this foot traffic from those places, from people who... I mean, I, I don't really know if most of the customers are from this neighborhood or elsewhere, but it could, I guess, lead them to walk towards, you know, in more into the neighborhood, and um, maybe it could increase crime. I know there, someone mentioned there's not really a correlation between sidewalks and increase of car, crime, but there, I mean, a, a, does somebody agree with me? Well, those people agree with me, and I've lived here since 1994, and I, um, I, it encourages me to walk into a neighborhood when there's sidewalks, and I just, either, either they would uh, increase the police presence there, maybe even have like a little satellite facility. I don't, I don't really know, but this is just kind of the beginning of, of my thought process on that. It, actually, the Devonshire residents, I think most of them agreed to have a sidewalk there in Ethan Allen, so. Those, I guess, places because it have the sidewalks, but Auburn, um, I guess we someone agreed that it probably wouldn't have the sidewalks. Um, so I'm not against sidewalks everywhere. I'm just certain areas where there's majority for sidewalks, I'm all for it. But 
where there's a majority against, yes. you have to kind of um, maybe have a little more discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have the police chief here, and I'm sure he's taken notes about uh, the observation on crime in that area. Do we have anyone else? Great. I want to thank you, and I know I'll let Colleen have the last word. <laughs> well, I do want to thank everyone for coming out. It's really terrific to see everybody. We have a lot more people uh, for our Ward 2 night this time, and um, we have these, I think it's twice twice a year now, so hopefully you'll come out again. Um, I really appreciate all the, the, the commentary and the opportunity to have the dialogue with everyone. So thank you all. But don't everybody leave. Yeah, you can stay. We're going to have a fascinating discussion of um, the use of cable equipment funds and the Comcast franchise agreement. Yeah. Oh, come on, come on, Ron, you want to stay. You don't get enough of that. Okay, the, the council is going to take a 10-minute break, uh, and then we'll be back with our regular agenda. <laughs> okay, we're back. Um, it's now time for, um, I don't have an, a, any additional agenda items. That would be for um, Mayor Williams to do. Um, but I would do like to open it up for a public comment period. Terry, are you coming to do public comment? No. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Pat Loveless, 7620 Maple Avenue, Tacoma Park, Maryland, Ward 4, your official peace delegate. I just wanted to uh, let you know that I uh, want to thank Ward 2 for coming out tonight. You guys showed some really lively uh, example of uh, community participation, citizen participation in community affairs. And I'm really glad to see that. I would like to... Uh, Ask the city council, or uh, when you guys are uh, going to your other meetings and stuff, and meeting around people in the community, to ask uh, everybody uh, when they when you run into the children and their mothers that it is summertime now. We've got the Fourth of July coming up. We've got the different uh, festivals coming up. We've got the street festivals coming up. Different uh, affairs coming up in our community. I would like to uh, ask uh, you people to remind the mothers to keep an eye on their children. And we don't want to have any uh, horror stories of missing children and abducted children in our neighborhood. I don't think my health could withstand it. If we ever got a report that some kid out looking for a place to smoke some weed found a skeleton in the, amongst the trash in our uh, parks and our, uh, in our uh, Woods somewhere, and I don't want to see that anywhere, and I don't even want to hear about that. My health would not be able to withstand that. So please ask everybody to keep an eye on their children as as, well, as much as you can, because we do have some pretty uh, perverted elements out there that we we cannot control. That we can we can we can do what we can to uh, avert a tragedy by uh, by asking our everyone and their uh, mothers and others to keep an eye on their children. We are the adults. We are the protectors of our children. And our children are our future leaders. And we must not ever forget that. Also, I'd like to know what we can do to uh, increase uh, community participation in, in our affairs. How we can get more uh, attendance to our city council meetings. I noticed the sidewalks had a pretty good idea. What should we do? Announce that we're going to build a stinking public urinal on every street corner <laughs> and make the homeowners responsible for keeping it clean? Now, that might get some more people to come out to our public comments <laughs> and our ward nights. We might get some more uh, citizen participation in, in our community affairs that way. But we must 
do something to stop the apathy that is starting to creep through our, our city. We are a city of activists. We are peace activists. We are, we are uh, loyal. We are concerned about our environment, as we have shown tonight. And we are concerned about the, the health and welfare of our neighborhood, our neighbors. So please, we must increase citizen participation in this meeting. We have all these seats for our auditoriums. We have all these empty seats. We didn't build these seats to be sitting empty and idle. Right. It's a pretty tragic sign when our city shows empty seats. That's a sign of apathy. And we must do what we can to fill these seats. And also, I want to see voter registration kits out on our ward nights and our different community events. Like tonight, there should have been some... Uh, <coughs> There should have been some uh, voter registration kits out there, as well as some sugar-free uh, brownies and stuff. I have a sugar brownie, and I'm diabetic. I should be careful of that, but I'll admit it. I can't say no on ward night. So please, let's get some sugar-free stuff out there. Mm. It seems like I'm diabetic. Because, uh, you know, we do uh, have other people in our community who cannot or should not have sugar. So uh, I just wanted to pass that on. But the main thing is, is we got to do what we can to get out there and vote. And you guys now have to work a little harder at your campaigns now that you guys did not put any voter registration kits out this year in the ward nights. And I've been trying to get people to do it. And I would like to know, when we start up the ward nights again, can we please put voter registration kits out and, and get our people who are not registered to vote out there to learn the importance of voting and to please register to vote and come out to vote. So please do those three things I'm asking. More citizen participation, more uh, care for our children and, uh, and uh, vigilance over our children because we are their guardians. Whether we know it or not, we are their guardians. We're adults. And three, the importance of voting. Please, I want to see more people out there voting I'd like to. I don't want to see empty uh, voting booths. I don't want to see real short lines. Now that's not like a supermarket. I like to see long lines at the voter registration places. Thank you, Pat. I like to see long lines when we vote. Come on, let's get out there and do our civic duty. Thank you very much. Tacoma Park rules. Anyone else have a comment? I'm sorry that I couldn't speak during our two time about these other issues. I would love to just have some conversation with the public works director. I wanted to know there is some concern within more about the property on the McLaughlin School that is for sale, especially the 2.6 wooded acres, um, uh, to see what can be done with that. And I know we haven't even bared to dare to talk to the city about possibly acquiring that for open space because of the difficult budget times, but I think if people can think about allocating money for planning and building sidewalks, maybe we should think about reallocating our money for open space there. Um, and the other question would be is in terms of what is our status of the open space at Poplar and Sligo Mill properties. I know there's been a very minuscule glacier movement on that. Um, but it is an issue that's, um, I think open space is an issue that is concerned to all of our folks, and I feel like maybe in a bit of an interloper when I come on the other ward night to ask these questions, so um, I'm just asking those questions. Does the city manager have any information on that, those two? Um, obviously, the Washington McLaughlin property, I think we had some correspondence with the council. I'm sorry, Catherine, I don't remember the exact date. Um, <laughs> And at least the direction at that time that was that the council was not interested in the city pursuing purchase of the property. In terms of Poplar Sligo Mill, I don't remember the exact figure, Catherine. I can email you tomorrow. There is some funding um, in the FY12 budget to continue doing some work on that property, and I'll send that information to you tomorrow. Great. Thank you. Any other public comment? It's now time for council comments. Don't see any lights. Okay. <clears throat> I think Councilmember Seaman got there first. 
All right. Thank you. And then Council Member Schultz and Council Member Clay. Thank you, Council Member Snipper. I, um, my wife and I this weekend uh, attended the uh, bicycle recycling art um, unveiling uh, throughout the city, and I just want to encourage everybody. It's going to be there until I think October, and I encourage uh, people to take a little stroll from the Tacoma Junction on down through to uh, uh, the other side of the uh, railroad tracks on uh, Carroll Street in the District of Columbia. There are <coughs> Uh, seven di seven different uh, art uh, displays of sculptures that were done by uh, various artists using bicycle parts, um, and I'm not going to uh, act as judge for those, but there are some very interesting and clever uh, displays, and uh, it was a, a great event. I thank uh, the Old Tacoma Business Association for <laughs> sponsoring that competition and uh, hosting the event on, sa on Saturday. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Member Schultz. Thank you. Uh, this, um, I guess, apropos some comments that were raised during War, war II night about progress on New, new Hampshire Avenue. Um, this uh, last Friday, uh, I had the uh, uh, unique pleasure to be part of a bus tour uh, held by members of the uh, Fed Committee of the Montgomery County Council who uh, were, had uh, scheduled a sort of a last minute bus tour, a familiarization tour of the uh, Ward uh, Tacoma Langley sector plan area. So they had the, a large bus which was way too big for trying to get around the, the, the streets in, in that neighborhood streets and alleys. Um, but it was about an hour to an hour and a half uh, jaunt around that particular neighborhood. Uh, it's a commercial area there. And uh, the, uh, the included in this group were Nancy Florine, who's the chairman of the County Council's Fed Committee. Fed stands for uh, Planning, um, Economic Development, and and housing, but not necessarily in that order, because um, it wouldn't spell Fed if you did it that way. Um, Valerie Irvin, who is, is uh, our uh, representative, but she's also president of the Montgomery County Council. Um, George Leventhal, who's elected at large from out of this area, and also we had Francois Carrier, who is chairman of the uh, county's planning commission. Uh, plus a, uh, a, a number of uh, county council staff members and plan, uh, planning uh, department uh, staff who actually sort of led the uh, so-called tour. Um, to just to basically the idea was to help the various people who are on the uh, county council and the planning commission just to get a, 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 a practical literal uh, physical uh, view so they can really really understand much better what it is we're actually talking about with regard to the proposed changes in that area because a lot of these people don't frequent this section of Montgomery County by the sheer nature of where they and where they live and where they work and that sort of thing and so um, it, it fell upon me in the absence of the mayor to represent Tacoma Park and try to help them understand, since this is in my ward, uh, what they were looking at, what was going on in these certain blocks, and to um, talk about what the pot potential possibilities <coughs> and the, uh, are for certain of those uh, commercial blocks, and to explain what the concerns were of the residents in the adjacent neighborhoods. So it was a very productive, kind of informal uh, session. A lot of questions, a lot of ideas uh, bandied ar around, talked about um, among the planning staff uh, and the uh, county council members and the, and the planning commission people. So it was a healthy, healthy exercise. I learned a lot, and I also think that they learned a lot. And I felt that it was, uh, uh, I really want to thank them because I felt like it was an extra effort on their part 
to uh, to uh, plan this uh, uh, tour just just for their benefit, uh, so that they could be in a better position to make uh, good judgments, good decisions as they uh, move forward to adopt the sector plan. In my conversations with some of those, uh, the feeling still seems to be that the uh, uh, the Planning Commission hopes to wrap up its work on the sector plan and the, and the CRT zoning uh, this summer. Uh, they still are shooting and think they have a reasonable chance of getting both the sector plan and the CR zoning approved prior to, their, uh, pr pr uh, prior to the end of this summer, as they had been saying uh, since the beginning of this year. So um, I think that um, this was a, a, a positive step, I think it was constructive, and I think it will help them uh, do a better job in making their decisions. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Clay. So um, I also enjoyed the uh, bicycle artwork, was it called Recycle Tacoma? And uh, took one of the kids down and we, we tried them all out and spun the wheels. I really like the egg one in front of the uh, co-op was a lot of fun, and the musical one in front of the uh, um, Tacoma Bikes. Um, what I noted is that there was a Long and Foster sign in front of every uh, one of them in the junction area, like strategically placed to um, block the artwork and uh, provide attention to the sign. I don't know if you guys noticed that on Saturday and Sunday. Um, from the Bethesda office, nonetheless. So. Um, it would be great if we could message to Long and Foster that uh, it's actually illegal to post their signs in the public right of way and, um, and pushing the levels of offensiveness to stick it in front of our brand new public art facilities. Um, another thing is that I received notice uh, before the meeting that um, one of our restaurants uh, in Ward 2 out of Africa which is along the come to, come to Africa. Sorry, <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. Um, come to Africa along the board, the New Hampshire Avenue uh, corridor has. Um, it w will be doing a presentation at the council meeting on July 5th about their request for uh, alcohol uh, sales, an expansion essentially of their existing alcohol sales license, which I believe was turned down by the county uh, following a. Uh, a letter of non-support, essentially, from the city. Yeah, it was. It was suspend. The consideration was suspended, suspended. waiting to hear from the city council. So, um, so this is their opportunity to come and talk to the city council, and I, I'm going to message it out to uh, the folks in Ward Two and Dan uh, Robinson, Councilman Robinson. You might uh, want to uh, uh, do that as well, to the extent it affects people in your in your neighborhood, um, so we can get some public comment and public participation on that. Thank you. Council Member Wright. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to um, give a quick update to people on the Washington gas work in the Penn neighborhood. Um, we had a, a good meeting with Washington Gas uh, at the church on Tulip and, and Maple, um, and the city has committed to uh, pro providing a, a normal landing page on the city website for the duration of the the gas work and be able to give updates, um, including uh, giving a, a posting of the full letter uh, that went out to people, which actually for most people only was one-sided when it was actually supposed to be two-sided. Um, so that that'll be that letter is supposed to be remailed out to people, but as soon as it's out there, we'll also have it on the city website and more detail about um, which houses are supposed to be getting which types of, of work. Some of them need to be connected back at the street versus actually having work done from the main all the way to the house and in some cases actually inside the house so um, more to come on that and, and I'll make sure to send around the, the the website so that people can check it for updates on a regular basis great thank you um, I just have a, a quick note um, due to a uh, family emergency in my wife's family. I will not be um, at next week's session. Um, okay, I think it's now time for um, city manager's comments. Just two quick items. I did want to share with Mr. Loveless that the city clerk um, had did indeed have uh, voter registration kits available this evening uh, for Ward 2. 
And uh, Chief Ricucci also asked for a few minutes just to address the council with some um, recent crime in incidents that have been of concern to the community. Got to loosen up. It's been a long <laughs> night. <laughs> Um, as we sat here tonight, we've put out a community advisory, but um, we had, uh, we've mentioned in several community meetings, and we had one advisory out that uh, vans have been, minivans have been the target of auto thieves. And over the weekend, we had three attempts and one successful uh, in the city. We would remind all owners of minivans to uh, make sure you lock your vehicle, uh, make sure it's parked in a lighted spot, and uh, there are different things you can buy at, at auto stores. I would recommend the bars. The city used to uh, sell them. Uh, we can no longer get them, or we'd be selling them also. But uh, a bar on your steering wheel will uh, eliminate them uh, punching your ignition, which they did in three of the vehicles they were unable to steal. Uh, the funny thing is the three attempts were in the middle of the night, Saturday night, and yesterday evening in pure daylight at around 7 o'clock, they uh, stole them, uh, a Dodge van over on... Uh, on Maple Avenue. So I would remind our residents that you have vans. They are the targets. There was no pattern to this. It's all throughout the city. Uh, uh, we were we have been concentrating in one area and will now obviously be concentrating on the entire city with the uh, what happened over the weekend. Two, we for the last 18 months we haven't had too many problems with cars being broken into. <clears throat> over the last 10 days, we've had several cars broken into. Well, they weren't broken into, they were left unlocked, so I guess I'm reminding our residents once again, please lock your cars and please don't leave valuables in them. Um, I know I've said this quite a few times over the last couple of years, but uh, we've done really good because we've really reduced it and stopped it, and for some reason everybody has gotten a little um, loose in leaving the cars unlocked, so I would ask that you lock them. Um, unfortunately, there's no one left from, well, yes, there is, from Ward, there's two from Ward 2. <laughs> Uh, just to talk about the gas stations, um, and I'm sure none of the thieves are listening to this. We have been, uh, we've had a presence on New Hampshire Avenue over the last three months, uh, and I'm not even going to go how many days. I will tell you this, we have prevented three. We just haven't caught them because they've gotten into the District of Columbia where we could not chase them at the time. Um, I will also tell you, it seems that they also know when we are off and we've reversed our schedules, but they, uh, they're getting pretty good at it. Uh, we've only been hit when we haven't been present, and I won't go what our presence are, but we have had a very big presence on New Hampshire Avenue at the gas station. I will add that we've had some very candid conversations with the owner about assisting us with better cameras and having them pointed in a better direction and posting signs. We have posted signs. We've now asked him to post a sign. The good news is the last few uh, thefts have not been our Tacoma Park residents, so I think they have got the message and people from outside to come apart who have been victims. Uh, this is a major crime. We are now working with uh, both Hyattsville, 3rd District, 4th District, and 5th District, uh, and PG County on this. Uh, there's probably been close to 200 of these thefts from cars where they rush in and get the purse over the last since back in October. Hmm. And uh, there have been arrests made. Uh, we believe. They get back out because it's a misdemeanor, and they continue to do it. It's a quick way to make money, and we obviously remind our residents to lock your car when you're pumping gas, please. Chief, what is the uh, policy for uh, pursuing a vehicle into the district when uh, an officer has seen something like that happen? It's got to be a felony before they can pursue, and that's a misdemeanor based on what we, if it's just a purse. We don't know what's in the purse at the time. Uh, the only way we can pursue them is if we developed enough probable cause. The one pursuit we had, it was a stolen auto, and that justified our, our pursuit into the district. Uh, they know that the, the line is their uh, sanctuary, so to speak, uh, and we're very, I think you all know by now, we're very strict with our rules about pursuit. From a liability standpoint, from sure. standpoint I don't want people getting hurt. Uh, we're trying different methods, which I won't go into, to try to keep them in the county and keep them in the parking lot. Uh, but it's got to the point we actually recognize them when they pull up, and they recognize us. That's the other day. They didn't even pull in the lot. One of our sergeants recognized this is them because we've seen, we've got it down almost to a T, who they are, what they look like, and the type of cars they use. And they looked to the left and saw us and took off down the other side into the district once again without doing anything, obviously. But uh, we will catch them because we're determined, and it's become a challenge for the members of our tactical enforcement unit, because um, 
somebody is going to get hurt, and that's my biggest concern, or it'll be a carjacking or somebody will get run over. And obviously, we want to prevent it, but I want to assure the residents we have got a presence on New Hampshire Avenue every morning. Two little things, Chief. Um, and afternoon, I'm sure. <laughs> why can't you get the bars anymore, the clubs? They don't. They don't distribute them to the police department. We, I looked into this because they had them when I got here. We sold them all out pretty quick, mm -hmm. and then when we went to get them, they no longer will distribute them to us. They're distributing <coughs> them to retail. I think it's about making profit. I see. And the other is for the per, for the education of um, the the listeners or others. Um, what's what does it mean when you say they punch an ignition? Basically, the ignitions on the Dodge Caravans are very easy to. Once you punch it, they can take the wires. It's very easy to start up. It's I see. most of the cars aren't like most vehicles aren't like that anymore. But Dodge has been a little slow in uh, catching up with modern technology. So, and the bad guys are always one step ahead of us. And they so. know which ones are easier. Okay, yeah. thanks. I was, might also add that we, we do need some residents for the Come to Africa hearing. Uh, I have been had the presentation by the uh, restaurant, and they're going to bring in a large contingent and a very professional rep, uh, presentation. But we do need the citizens to speak. Yeah, work on that. Okay. I'll, I'll tell them it's uh, about the sidewalks. <laughs> <laughs> Men will be mobbed. <laughs> Thank you. Chief, can I ask you a question? Uh, that, that I understand from some residents that there was some kind of uh, very police good. presence on Glenside Court. Yeah, we put out late this afternoon, uh, Councilman Schultz, we put out, we had a... Uh, oh. Stolen auto, uh, our officers uh, observed a vehicle in a suspicious manner, went to make a traffic stop. Uh -huh. The uh, suspects jumped out of the vehicle. Uh, we were able to catch two out of the three. Okay. I saw uh, we that. We did use canine dogs, and okay. there was a big neighborhood uh, okay. that Thank went on that got yeah. quite a bit of traffic. I saw that listening. email. I just wasn't yeah, so sure right. if that was the... Uh, yeah, that's the one. Okay. We didn't get it out right away because we were trying to identify the third suspect, which we have done. We yeah. just haven't and, picked him up. And I appreciate that. I understand that that's why sometimes you have to delay. Good. So the third suspect will get picked up, so we will have all three. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anything else? <clears throat> Do we have a uh, legislative update? Uh, just a reminder that if you want to get information and suggestions in for legislative action requests for MML, please do so so that when you come back from uh, the convention, um, you can vote on resolution regarding them. Thank you. I don't think we have, we don't have any minutes to adopt the correct data. Okay, finally, move into our presentation of the evening, the use of cable equipment funds on the Comcast franchise agreement. Do you want to have an introduction? Uh, yes. Um, I'm happy to have uh, Missy Herrera from Montgomery County here. Um, and uh, I think in the cover sheet, I just want to highlight a couple points about the, city, about the presentation. Uh, city of Tacoma Park is a co-franchiser with Montgomery County for the provision of uh, cable television services. And as you know, we get a good amount of money uh, through those um, franchise fees and cable equipment grants. The county, though, is the entity that handle, handles those funds, administers the franchise agreements with Comcast, RCN, and Verizon. Mitzi Herrera is the county's cable and broadband administrator. I, I kind of informally introduced her as the queen of cable, but that's, that's not her <laughs> formal title. Um, and she'll talk a little bit, give you a little bit of briefing about what the cable television uh, structure is here in Montgomery County, the role of her office, um, how the cable equipment funds can be used. I know that was of interest to many council members. Um, and also talk a little bit about uh, what the city council's role will be um, as we deal with the renewing of franchise agreements. And so I'll turn it over to Mitzi. Good evening. <laughs> um, Thank you for having me here. I'm very pleased to join you. Uh, I did want to just say a couple quick um, thank you. Suzanne has been wonderful in her new role to work with. Um, we were, as somebody who worked with Lonnie Moffitt for several years, um, we were sorry to see that it was because of the budget cuts. Um, I know that was a big loss uh, for the county, but I'm happy to report that Suzanne has been learning what she needs to know. Learning, learning cable TV. And that um, I did want to give a, a special thank you to Alvaro um, Calavia, who has been a great partner for us. Um, there have been a lot of collaborative things that we've been doing across the different cable channels, and so you are 
very um, ably represented by your staff. And lastly, I just wanted to really thank all of you in your foresight in uh, redesigning this space and being willing to have it as a space that you could use both for your council meetings and as a public performance space. Um, that has really enabled the city to put a lot more original cable programming using resources that you've already had, using your robotic cameras. Um, and that is, um, I will tell you, that's actually something that I'm very jealous of that and your lab downstairs and the county is rapidly looking to see how we can imitate that. Um, so I'll let you know about that. Um, and so with that, uh, let me just say, I actually had one last point, which is that while you may have few members in your actual audience, uh, I do believe when I was a resident of Tacoma Park that your council meetings are very well watched um, on the cable channels and while it's not the same, it's very hard to get some Nielsen data for things that are that small, but you do have a lot of metrics that come from your website and web streaming of that. Um, so those are things, there's actually the county, the last time they did a study, they showed that 79% of the people in the county in the last year did not attend a public meeting hosted by an elected officials, but 86% of the people had watched the channel. So, um, so I just would point that out to you and that one of the things that you may want to look at as a way of um, increasing participation are using things that enable you like blogs, um, texting, and you can have those using internet connections, have those live during meetings. It is a, a sort of meeting management issue. It is a sort of, do you, do you use all the comments? Do you limit them? Do you just read them or how that might go? But that those kinds of things, a lot of times what we find, is, at least anecdotally, is that a lot of citizens would like to participate, but they just don't, you know, if I have limited resources, do I spend my babysitting money so that I can come and attend the council hearing Versus I could watch it in my living room and I can follow up with you and I'm sure many of them do follow up with <coughs> you and tell you they saw you on TV. Um, so there is that. Um, and you know, and in the county we tend to have these things and they happen during the work day. So there's no perfect solution to it, but I would just point out to you that you, you tend to be on the forefront. It is a, a sort of smaller pool and it can be something that you can look at piloting. Um, there are ways to have it be compliant with Open Meetings Act. Um, and so I would just encourage you to continue on that. Having said that, um, I guess the, I know that the hour is late, so I think what may be, may be the most efficient thing here is, is to actually, for me to know what it is you want to hear and answer those questions. Uh, I could give you a brief overview. I just, I guess it would be helpful to me what you would like, what would be the, make the most sense for you. I think a, a brief overview would be very helpful. Okay. So the, the, um, the, the county has three cable franchises, Comcast, Verizon, and RCN. The Comcast franchise will expire in uh, June of 2013. The RCN franchise, I believe, is June of 2014. The federal law, um, the way that it works is that typically in the past what has happened is the county has had some conversations with the municipalities. The county typically negotiates an agreement with the provider and then um, um, cookie cutter versions of it are created for the municipalities. There are, I, I believe there's about 17 municipalities actually within um, the county. Rockville and Tacoma Park are the largest of those. In some cases there can be some small um, tweaks to those, but this essentially the county sort of is looking at a template. And so part of what we try to do is to incorporate what would be the concerns. And we have actually had a meeting um, with Suzanne attended, Doug Reich from Rockville, outside council um, representing those, those municipalities and some other ones uh, attended. And so we, we sort of had a, a discussion of, of what were the things that we were most concerned about in trying to, trying to look to prioritize those. The um, the franchise federal law um, permits the county to look at a renewal and you can consider four factors. Those factors have, are what is your compliance with the existing franchise, the quality of your service including the signal quality and your response to, to complaints. I would note does not include rates or channel lineup. Those are not factors you can consider. 
You can consider as a third factor is the financial, legal, and technical qualifications of the cable operator, which is really looking at is this cable operator have sufficient cash to be able to operate the system, provide maintenance, and so forth. Um, and then the last thing is that they have to take into account the future cable-related needs. In many ways, federal law is, is in some ways stacked towards granting the franchise because it's sort of looking at there is an investment that there are facilities, there's fiber, there's, there's coax, it's all placed in the ground that exists, and that's a sunk investment. And so if the provider doesn't get it renewed, that would be a lost Investment. So the so, so federal law are, is clear and it sort of limits it to those factors. Um, and it's it's there's actually been case law which had things that you couldn't put the initial you couldn't put the the franchise agreement on the ballot because voters might consider other factors than those four things. So it's just as important to remember that really what you've got to be looking at it's got to fit into one of those four boxes. Um, the, what we have done is the county has gone ahead and um, we have some requests for consultants who will help us analyze. We've already done an audit already and we will do another audit of the, you have a three year window so I, I, so I, I got to do my math here, but uh, we did six, seven, and eight, to, to 2006, seven, and eight, and then we will do nine, 10, and 11 at the end of this year. Um, we um, are looking in my office is largely involved in determining compliance and complaints and compiling that. We, what you're going to be probably most interested in is that we will have a consultant who's looking at the um, future cable related needs. And essentially the way that process works is it's, there's a survey that goes out and there's a series of focus groups. You will be interviewed, your staff will likely be interviewed, there will be public groups in which you're, you try to arrange them based on libraries, seniors, um, you know, various representations of people out in the community. And what you're trying to look to see is what are the things that we see that are cable related that are going to occur over the term of the contract. And that contract likely will be somewhere between 8 and 15 years. Um, 15 years is the length that, it, that the other ones have been. Some cable operators have been wanting to look for shorter term contracts. For us, it's also a question of the, we, what we want to try to avoid is what I would just call is the death spiral of you have one cable operator who comes in and you negotiate a deal. You have the second one comes in and says, well, I don't want to do anything more than the first one. You know, I'll take a better deal, but I don't want to have any more conditions. And you can kind of end up in this thing where each person coming in wants to have less in their agreement because I want the same terms with somebody that you negotiated 7, 8, 15 years ago. So one thought we're trying to, we are considering is whether we go with a shorter term and then all the franchises would expire at the same time. Now that's sort of, a, from frankly, kind of a staffing nightmare. Um, but on the other hand, it may be a way to ensure that where you have changes, you want to have things come up that you can have equal terms and you kind of get yourself out of that race to the bottom. Um, Lastly, um, I should talk about is the, the, the key issues that are likely to come up in this negotiation. One is, the, under, the, under the federal law, localities, a franchising authority may negotiate for a franchise fee. The federal law caps that at 5%. All three franchises are currently at 5%. Um, and you have in your packet, uh, if I just cheat here for a minute. If you look in your packet on circle 18, is that right? Or no? Or oh, is that just, no, that's, that's, our, that's our number, yeah, just, right? Yeah, whatever. Oh, okay. So in your packet, just on, in the memo that's attached to it, it would be on mem um, page 3 under federal law. With federal law, it has a long list and it says these are things that are, um, all these things count as franchise fees, except... And among the exceptions listed there um, are a franchise fee does not include capital costs, which are required by the franchise to be incurred by the cable operator for public educational and government access facilities. That is the reason why when the county has negotiated additional fees to support equipment, which we commonly refer to as PEG equipment or public educational government access equipment, 
Um, that is why those fees are not considered within the cap, so long as they're used for capital purposes. And capital is a, is a broad term under federal law. It's not sort of the way that you would typically think of it. Um, it really does mean equipment, facilities, construction. Um, so under the franchises right now, Verizon and RCN pay 3% of gross revenues as the PEG capital fee. Comcast right now plays, pays a flat fee that's adjusted by the Consumer Price Index. And at the time, they had agreed to front load that so that there was some upfront money because there were some renovations and things that needed to occur. When the Comcast franchise it used to be held by, some people remember it was Montgomery County Cable, Prime held it, it was transferred to Comcast as a settlement to a variety of issues. Comcast agreed to pay a settlement, and that settlement resulted in additional funding for public educational government access support. And those are dollars that you can use towards operating cost. Um, so what we would want is, the county is one is looking to make sure that the capital equipment fee that we negotiate from Comcast is at least equivalent to 3% that Verizon and RCN are paying. However, there is nothing under federal law that precludes Comcast from voluntarily agreeing that a portion of that money could be used for operating as opposed to just capital. We cannot require that, but they can, we can negotiate it and they could agree to it. Um, and what I, I do have to make a, a, a specific pitch here, since your legislative section came up, is currently pending it has been introduced in the House of Representatives in Congress is H.R. 1746, which is the called the CAP Act, Community Access Preservation Act. That is addressing, there's 19 states in which they've had state franchising and they're looking at, 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 at pushing PEG support back to existing levels. But the portion of the bill that you care about, that I care about, that we all should care about, is the end of it, which basically makes some minor changes to the text that you just looked at here, which would basically enable you to use that money for PEG operating or capital. So that additional funding, it still has to be funding that is dedicated towards supporting public educational government access, um, but it could be used for operating or for capital, which at some level, when you have a, a, a something like where you're renovating this facility, you're updating to digital, you're moving to HD, you're adding things that are more interactive, you have big capital needs. But then at some point you actually need to have pay somebody to operate these digital cameras. Because as much as we say they're robotics, you have people in <laughs> staff, they yeah. do actually require people to run. Um, and so we're looking for that flexibility and we can send through Suzanne um, resolutions and support and lobbying That's efforts great. that you can do. One of the things that Maryland is, is really hampered by is that in the changes in Congress, on the key committees that look at these issues, there are no Maryland members. Um, however, Senator Mikulski continues to be a strong presence from the appropriation, Senator Cardin, and, and, our, and um, you know, Representative Van Hollen sits in, in a leadership position, and Representative Edwards is also big on technology issues. So I, I just have to make that, that pitch in there that because this will be of, of primary importance for Tacoma Park particularly is the ability to have some flexibility. The, um, the last two pieces I would mention about this is that when I say public educational government access, by a quirk in federal law, what that also encompasses are institutional networks, commonly called INETs, and for in the county is what we call FiberNet. FiberNet is basically a fiber optic ring in which we use to provide data, telecom, video services. Tacoma Park is part of that, um, or I think that, that, that did finally occur. Um, it's how we provide broadband to our elementary, high school, middle schools, um, and so forth, and, and to various community centers, regional service centers, and so forth. You can use, when I say PEG access, that includes that. So construction, expansion of that, um, that can be encompassed in there. Um, and then uh, the last thing that I, I need to note is that when the county... The, the way it works right now is that the county and the municipalities have each negotiated separate memorandums of understanding. So the county handles the inspection functions. They handle the complaint resolution. We negotiate the franchises. And 
for that, the municipalities in the franchise fee, there is a 30% um, a of it is retained by the county, um, and that covers the cost of those services. In the RCN franchise, where the equipment money is passed through, it's based on subscribers. And the franchise fees are passed through the municipalities based on the number of subscribers that you have there. It's a proportional arrangement. When the Verizon franchise was negotiated, um, I'm not entirely certain whether there were there was this uh, there was this feeling that that between the, the Rockville Tacoma Park Maryland Municipal League, which each have a community station, um, and then the county, the schools, the college, and the public access community access station, those are seven entities. So the thinking was is that well each of those entities is going to require equipment. So instead of doing a proportional, and people weren't sure at the rate in which Verizon would build out, and it might take several years and so forth, so what they what we had agreed to was that it would be split one seventh to Tacoma Park, Rockville, and uh, Maryland Municipal League each, and then the other four sevenths to the county. But because of the growth of Verizon, um, what's happening now is that. Verizon has very few subscribers in some areas of the county, um, and but the proportional split works out that w that if you think about it, the franchise fees for Tacoma Park are five percent of gross revenues. The equipment is roughly three percent of gross revenues. So by that thinking, the amount of money you're receiving in equipment should be slightly less than what you're receiving in franchise fees. But in fact, it's like three times more. And it's because that one-seventh formula is so skewed. Mm -hmm. It's not matching up Verizon subscribers. So what's going to happen is, is that when we look at whatever deal we end up with with Comcast and how that goes to the municipalities, we are going to go back and take a look at addressing the inequity in the Verizon, um, the, the payout formula. So I just wanted to make you aware of, of that. But at the same time, I will also say that I think that given where you are in your renovation, given where Rockville recently had one, where we are in digital, what is likely to be a, a situation is that you're going to need more operating money than, than capital, frankly. Um, so, but we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the changes. We will show the, the fact of the matter is between the county and the municipalities, we have more needs than we actually fund in through the equipment dollars. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, we're still going to ask for the same amount because and the amount that we're spending is greater than what we're receiving in. We make a larger investment. Um, but I did want to make you aware that that would happen. What is, is likely to happen is through the negotiation process is that we would um, basically just seek to, we, it's a sort of a kind of progress update, and one of the things I've offered to the council is, is that there's there's updates and there's updates. So for those folks who have a very strong interest in it, we can provide a more detailed briefing. And then for those folks who just kind of want to know the progress, there will be a kind of more 10,000 foot briefing. And it's your option. You know, we'll include whichever list you want to be on. But I, I just because I know that that you have a lot of things to to go, and some people have more interest in it, and more time for it, and so we're just trying to work on that. So with that, I think um, why don't I just ask you what questions you've got, and let me see what I can do. Councilmember Clay, <laughs> thank you for that comprehensive report. I'm going to watch it again on streaming video. <laughs> Back through my head a couple and, times. And, and if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, and I, I will be happy to answer individual questions. Sure. So um, I have a couple questions. Mm -hmm. um, one, I should probably get closer to the microphone. One is, um, to what extent does the county play programming that's developed in Tacoma Park? I'm particularly thinking of the Jazz Fest and the Folk Festival and those things. Um, the county cable. We, the county plays very little role in that. I will say that the the managers of those stations, they meet monthly, and they do try to um, uh, do collaborative work. So sometimes you can have something that's happening in one area, people ask, will you carry it, or I need some support, or, or you have certain ideas. Um, there is, for the, specifically for the Jazz Fest 
those things. Um, right now, the county has a vehicle, um, the mobile production vehicle, so creative a name, and it's really the big truck that you see out at these events. The county provides the engineer for that, and in the past, we have provided some dollars um, for production staff. Um, frankly, there aren't that many events. It does come up occasionally as a thing of like, well, should we have to come to Park pay for it because they're the ones who have, you know, you have multiple festivals and things. So far, we haven't gotten to that role. But so in terms of supporting that, we don't actually play any creative role. We just are providing some staffing and equipment in that case. And then the last thing is, is that we have um, the county this year had launched. So we're, we're at about the one year mark for um, county report this week which is a, um, it is a collaborative effort of six of the stations in which there is news, programming, um, events. At Tacoma Park, based on their staff availability, they, they, run the, they run the show, but they also have the ability to contribute a package, a two-minute, three-minute um, video that can go in there. Also, any public service announcements that are timely since it runs each week and it runs on six different channels, those can be inserted into there. And one thing I would note since Alvaro is here that the um, bicycle art might make a very nice piece <laughs> for <a> County Report. <laughs> Sam's the long imposter. Yeah. 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 If, if I might, just, just a reminder for folks too that our station is shown throughout Montgomery County with the exception of the city of Gaithersburg. So mm -hmm. almost anybody in Montgomery County um, can watch what we have on our station. That's great. I was and, just curious. And do. And do. And do. I was just curious to know. It, that's true. People stop me and they're like, I know you. I've seen you on television. And I'm like, do you live in Tacoma Park? No. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, no, I was just curious to know to what extent the other stations utilize the, um, besides the fact that it's seen in different places, uh, my understanding was some other stations were actually playing the, the tapes. Up from, and I'm, there, there I'm have been, curious. it's sort of on a, on a case by case basis, and, it, and it's literally one of those things of like, hey, we have this event, is anybody else interested? A lot of times I would say it's probably the college channel, mm -hmm. uh, Montgomery College um, tends to do a lot of that. And also because you might have something. No, Clay is uh, Montgomery Community Media. They made a, a, pack of, uh, a few packages of the, the best of the last year's festival. <coughs> we provided them the tapes and they made the editing. So that would be the community access station. Yeah. And they actually have two channels. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that was one question. What was my other question? I can't think of it right now, so let's go on somebody else to remember. Okay. <laughs> Council Member Robinson. Um, you, you know, in Tacoma Park, we're known for our festivals mm -hmm. and also for the amount of blabbing we do down here. <laughs> And um, and I wonder, can you give an overview of how much um, talk show-oriented um, programming there is at the county or in the other municipal stations or in the MML station, and how you see that um, contributing to the sense of democracy, either in the municipalities or in the county? Um, well, let me answer that question in two ways. One is you might, your larger question about how does it contribute to democracy, and the other is what makes good TV. Mm -hmm. So let me be blunt about that. Okay. Um, and, and, and let me say that the, I think that the single largest factor is cost. It's relatively inexpensive to have a talk show that has one or more people in a confined studio, and, and you, it's basically live to tape. Um, you can, so, so it, it is in its most raw sense, mm -hmm. right? And that's, I think, why we have a lot of that that has developed that way. I do not think that that is necessarily a good thing if, in fact, because of cost cutting, that is the bulk of the programming. Or, and I would say in the council, um, the, you know, if you subtract out the amount of minutes that you're spending just showing council meetings, mm -hmm. um, those would be there. What I would say is now, but, but having said that, there are things that you can do in that talk show format that can actually be more um, engaging and interactive with people that are relatively low cost, but they do cost some, they do take some time, and it's a staffing issue. So one thing is, I, I think what's important, and I will make a pitch for this, that we are working, um, right now Verizon's system on their head end 
Um, they have it. It's in. It's it's off of Route 29. And and the fact is is that is that Channel 16 may be one thing in one jurisdiction in Virginia, and it's another thing here. So right now, technically, they've come to say, well, that means that we won't put any program information up there because all of these channels are essentially local. Well, the problem with that is when somebody tunes to your channel, they're looking for it. They can't tell, what am I watching? When can I find it again? I can't TiVo it. So that's a problem. And as Verizon has grown, that's become a bigger problem. We are working on a regulatory push to them. Of, that may be so that technically you don't have it, but it's not a technical impossibility. There needs to be an investment in, in sort of moving forward. So we are putting that. So that said, for people who are watching your show on Verizon, they can't tell what they're watching. So it's very important from a staffing standpoint, things that pop up that tell you the name of the program. Things that instead of having a half an hour discussion with two people that doesn't identify the two people during the show, is very hard to follow. So things that tell you this is who I'm talking to. Things if you just think about CNN that give you little little blurb summaries of you know the question was should they, should we have sidewalks, you know things like that that you can add in there. In addition, where you can add things in like so for example the county was having an interview with a woman from either the Parks Department or, or HHS talking about the bone density builders course you can you can tape that interview, you can put the website address when you edit it. You can put the website address of where you would find that information up there. You can put a slate in between that gives you and the bone density builders class upcoming in your area and you can list the dates and you can also do it so that you can take some of those things and you can rerun those programs and you swap out the dates and the promos. So you, you can have uh, on that sense. To the extent that the other thing is, is that what is very difficult, particularly since so many of our channels are government channels, in some ways I like to think that I, you know, I work for a four billion dollar corporation. That is Montgomery County. And Montgomery County has got a public relations arm. And like any public relations arm, they want to promote the positives. But if you're talking about democracy, traffic cameras are, are a perfect example. If you ask the city or you ask the county to t give you a statement about traffic cameras, there's absolutely nothing wrong with traffic cameras. They are a positive thing. They support the public safety. There are no concerns. If you ask the public, they have a varying opinion. So in terms of when you have democracy, how do you encourage that conversation? And one way of encouraging that is partnering things like Montgomery Community Media which is an, an independent, even though they're providing funding, they're looking at, at getting more fundraising, they are in a better position to actually have a, uh, what I would say is a more engaged dialogue about that and to ask those tough questions. One of the problems I think that has happened is, the other happening is, you know, there are some people, I, I would count myself among them, who love watching the, the raw hearing, they watch the council hearings, I watch C-SPAN. Not everybody falls into that bucket. Some people would like a a summary of what 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 were they talking about for two hours, or give me a heads up of what's going to happen. As a local government, you're you're in a you, sometimes you can do that well and sometimes not. And so one of the things that we're really trying to work with is with Montgomery Community Media to um, provide that kind of independent. So that yes, I'm showing you the you're, we're showing the council meetings, but some dialogue or discourse maybe that's produced by a different station. All right, then, then let me interrupt. The Montgomery Community Media you yes. said a couple of times, and that is an entity you said that gets funding not necessarily directly from the county. They, what they they do right now receive um, just the same way that the county allocates money for a government channel, mm -hmm. schools, college. They also do for a, a community media, and that. Okay. And so what's the? Is it a lot of money or a little? Uh, money it's or? two point. It's two point two million. Um, right. and, and how much uh, hands off are they? I mean, uh, how, how autonomous is Montgomery Community Media? Uh, they are largely autonomous in that they they control the content. However, 
like everybody else in this budget and fiscal climate, you want to know how you're spending the money, and so there's a certain level of scrutiny as to well, what are the outcomes. There's not a level of scrutiny so much as to the content, but really who's watching. You know, mm -hmm. we promote things that they may be talking about. These are the green energy initiatives. These are the things they did about jobs. In fact, they, they aired candidate forums. Um, this year, actually, among all the channels we collaborated, and for the first time ever, we had live election coverage on both the primary and the general, looking specifically at results within the county. So, you know, again, what I would say is you, you encouraging the dialogue, and, 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 and let me just sort of, sort of wrap this up as well as by saying, there are things like your computer lab downstairs. Um, mm. There are groups that are engaged with both the public in teaching people the, these are the tools that you have at mm. home. Um, this is how you can actually use the software you have, but you can attach this and you can actually get sound that you can understand mm -hmm. or lighting. Um, these are ways in which they're looking at ways that you can aggregate them together or what you thought was the news story. And it's also about an investment in young people in the same way that we taught them to, they knew sentences, they knew words, and you teach them to put them together into persuasive paragraphs. They know how to send pictures and take video and upload those things, but teaching them how to tell a coherent story, um, teaching them how to use those as per persuasive tools mm -hmm. um, and events, that really, I think, is sort of the next Frontier. And how will that come about through the Montgomery, uh, through that same entity, or some other? Do you, yeah, I, it I is. guess now I'm. I'm I, I don't want to. Uh, uh, I don't want to take too much of the time right. here, but I am. I am curious about um, the real challenges um, that you see in the future, in the next few years. Where you mentioned that we we forged a path, and that you're going to follow it as regards maybe this room or the the um, mm -hmm. the studio that we've got. And that sounds great. You know, oh boy, we love to be in front uh, in some things. Um, I'm back to the, my kind of small D thing. How how will you pursue that kind of access, real access for people at, at the Montgomery County level? And and how do you how would you just in a few words to kind of wrap it up? Um, what there is is one is you have to sustain the commitment over time. Mm -hmm. For example, we cut all the funding to provide youth media in the last budget. Um, however, we still were left with equipment dollars, so we were able to purchase um, audio equipment and things that enable youth media groups to go out and, and shoot things, and we promote them, and we work collaboratively with them. So one is you're making an investment, and you're working with outside groups. You're looking at how you can be involved with the schools and how the training programs that they may have at the various campuses, getting them out of the mindset of we have to have this $25,000 camera that we don't want to have any of the kids touch into. Mm -hmm. This is how you can teach them how to, this is how you can do news segments mm -hmm. um, and getting that. Or this is how you, if you shoot your, 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 your football game, we'll run it on the, on the channel. So you have that. You have these groups in which you can teach people. You have to promote so that people are aware of these are ways that I can upload my videos. These are ways that I can take training classes. Um, these are looking at, at developing really a new crop of people um, who will produce shows that are really looking at these issues. And one of the things really is is creating greater partnerships with bloggers. Um, there are a lot of community media people out there. They have specific blogs. They do these neighborhood things. So one of the things that we're looking at doing is on our watchlocaltv.org <coughs> site is that we would link to them. Um, also putting out information that shows people how you can, you have Granicus. You can actually take the Granicus system in the playback. You can use the Microsoft Silverlight. You can pull that two-minute clip talking about the sidewalk on this particular street. You can find a way that you can post it on your blog. You can email it around. You can put it on your websites. Mm -hmm. So it's you know giving people the tools, making those things uh, mm -hmm. available. And I would lastly say is that what we're trying to do is to look at um, University of Maryland has the J Lab, which is a journalism lab, looking at ways in which you can build um, a core of political, local political reporters. Other ones mm -hmm. are partnering with the Gazette, potentially, mm -hmm. um, where you can leverage the investment that you're making in the video medium with people, in which the government uses it and tells a side of the story. Opening those things up so that when you link those videos, the people can post comments, not being afraid of what they may say. 
Well, that's now you're. Um, uh, thank you very much for all of that. Now you're making me think that we could learn um, about things like right. that and link them with our local news sources and so forth for our station. But thank you very much for that. And again, we can have follow up mm -hmm. conversations about them. I already volunteered Mitzi to come back many times. Oh, so, good. yeah. yeah this is very is. I mean, and we can do a workshop. I mean, it is an area, and frankly, Tacoma Park would be a very good pilot for it because you have a natural constituency of people who are interested in there. I would say one last thing that you will notice that um, I think that yours is, your grant system is like ours. In government, people file things by date. That is probably the least helpful <laughs> means right, yeah, right. for the public to find something. So just the same way that your agenda can be split up and people can search for those things, finding ways that you can um, segregate out your video into different things, also understanding that the Internet is a very short attention. It's like the attention span of a gnat. You can see on these statistics where we have a half an hour pro program, the first block gets watched. And then if, you know, so putting things, and I'll tell you now that we have, when we run stories, what we're trying to get people engaged in doing is you put the show together, you have a two-minute version of it, and you have a 30-second that's a, a clip. Using your Twitter feeds to set out, hey, there's a new show about this, or the links to those things, um, where you have hot topics, like, we're talk like you're talking about an electric car, you know, here's the piece. All of our green things are sort of in there. And again, I would say, opening it up, so that people can watch the video and they can write comments on there and not being afraid. And Tacoma Park is probably the place that's least afraid of what people will say. Um, and, and that's a way to encourage that dialogue. Just a, one of the things that um, the uh, City TV staff have been doing, you know, we have a bulletin board. And so I sometimes end up watching it while I'm on the treadmill or whatever. But one of the things that is now, they're now able to do is to put video segments in there. So when they want to say, you know, Fourth of July is coming up, they can insert, you know, 20 seconds of the last Fourth of July parade. And all of a sudden, you know, it, it's a much more lively inter use of the video. And then, of course, we use our Facebook and whatever to, to link to some of these various things as well. Council Member Clay, did you remember your... <laughs> I did, but I, I got a whole host of other ideas that I wanted to ask about. But it's 1025, and yeah. so I'm going to take your business card and email them. Sure. Okay. Count, council Member Ray? I want to say anything we can do to, uh, you don't have to answer this, but just the emphasis on giving us flexibility to use funds on operating things as a nurse to equipment. And, and to that, I would, I would challenge you to support the CAP Act. Right. That is the single, if there's any message I can leave you with, it is to support the CAP Act, both through the resolution, lobbying members of Congress, if you've got visiting members, people from other states that live in your area, um, all of those things, and really have people understand that it is, it is a jobs creation. You know, it is basically, I could buy more equipment from foreign manufacturers, or I could employ people to use that equipment. And that's what it's really about. Um, thank you. Council Member Schultz. Thanks for coming. <laughs> uh, I can't say is that I've absorbed very much. It's, some of this is just like an, so, so new to me that I'm just like uh, at square one. But one of the things that, uh, that has interested me ever since I got on the City Council is, is, is the idea of how can, as, uh, as council members, how can we do a better job of being able to speak to our constituents um, and have and also a, a better job of uh, listening to them? Because um, the, the, the use of technology varies so greatly from one household to the next. <laughs> Some households here are, you know, Tacoma Park, are very cutting edge. They've got all the latest electronics in their home, and they can do all kind of whiz bang kind of stuff. And at the other end, you know, we have people that just not interested in it, or are afraid of it, or confused and just don't even know where to start. Uh, and everybody in between. And um, you know, I, for example, as a council member, I can communicate through listservs. But you know, and, and people are gradually adding their names to various listservs and in my ward, 
But it's still, it's still a minority. Um, and, and sometimes I find that maybe the best way to communicate is the old-fashioned way of printing a newsletter and going around and sticking it in people's uh, door, you know, in their uh, screen doors and thinking, well, this is a way that I can touch these people, letting them know uh, that I, I exist, that things are happening, stuff that they need to be aware of. Uh, and I, I've sometimes, you know, thought about this, and I guess my question to you is, is you know, because because the television is such a ubiquitous technology, everybody has it, I guess we can safely say, and everybody tends to watch it at some time of the day or the week. Uh, if if we can do somehow or another, the council can do find a technological way to get ourselves inside that TV box you know, through city cable uh, in a way that would be of interest and not bore people to tears. I mean, I mean any one of us could talk on a talk show for hours because we think we're all interesting and have so much to say about so many different things. But, but you know, within reason. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's as far as I can go because I don't understand the technology. To say most of what you just said is well-meaning, helpful, but I, a lot of it bounced off my thick skull, and I'll, I'll continue to learn. But I'm just curious as to how we can get into the new modes of better ways of being able to um, communicate to our constituents uh, uh, in, in a way that's not so ponderous as the city council. So a, a couple things there. Um, one is as part of the cable renewal, we're looking at doing a survey in which we're looking at really what is the, what is an effective way to communicate. Um, so, for example, are you interested in seeing a newsletter versus television? If it's a television program, is it better for you that it's a, you know, if it, there was five minutes that came on at six, seven, and eight, is that the better thing for you versus a, a half an hour that comes on at some point? And so we're sort of understanding that. Tacoma Park does a survey. You, you do a survey, but frankly, it's not very robust when it comes to the cable section. For one, when you ask people, do you watch the shows, but you don't first ask, do you have cable, mm -hmm. right? It, it, that, that, that had been an issue, which I think had been addressed. Putting things in there, when we develop the survey, we'll be happy to give you the questions, but the next one that you come out, that means you ask those questions of people. Do you use Facebook? Do you use Twitter? Would you watch a video? You know, you, you know and actually asking that. I would say that, frankly, within um, Tacoma Park, that if you had those same surveys and you ask people at the Jazz Fest, the Blues Fest, the Fourth of July Parade, I'm trying to think, you've got, is there one more? Street the street, the street festival, folk festival, the folk, folk festival. festival. Oh, that's what I was forgetting. Yes. Yeah. So, but you have these places where people come out. I would also say, frankly, it's just sort of my take, which hopefully Alvaro won't smack me in, <laughs> is a uh, live creating event television, which gets people to. You don't necessarily have the program. People are aware of your channel, mm -hmm. by and large, mm -hmm. but. I want to come down to the folk festival. How does it look? Is it hot? Is it, can I still get a good seat? You know, where, where it's coming on? Can I watch part of it in my living room? And then I'll come down. Oh, I can see so-and-so. Oh, we'll go down there and look for us on here. Oh, we're streaming it. You can look and see us. You know, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, that you can encourage people to, to, to do that. Um, looking at ways for people of, no. of, <laughs> of um, you, have, you have meetings, but again, would you be better off doing things where you have a call-in show? Mm -hmm. um, or where you have one in which people submit things in advance. And then, you know, I'm going to answer, we, I answer those questions, that can be a thing. Using blog technologies where, you know, here's the question, but it comes up from a lot of different constituents, mm -hmm. so I'm going to post the answer. Mm -hmm. um, do, uh, those can be other ways that you can engage with them. And, um, and again, you know, also it's repetition. So, you know, I get an email, and to get a newsletter, and to get a flyer on my door, and I watch the cable channel. I mean, you know, it doesn't hurt. You you campaign. It's about saying the same message over and over again sometimes. Um, you know, so those can be other ways um, that you can do it. And, and really, I would say, you know, frankly, when you're out at those festivals or you're walking in neighborhoods or you're at events, is ask people. 
Well, put out a survey mm -hmm. card of all the people that you had who came here for this meeting. You know, do we take the opportunity to get information from them? If you look at your statistics, how many people, it's probably a significant number of people, visit your website. And I will tell you from the county, we're not particularly doing a good job of taking advantage of the fact that you know, 300,000 people, unique visitors, came and, and looked at our site. I could have gotten information from those people. Uh, that, and, and so looking at those kinds mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. uh, as well. So I think those are great ideas. That's the kind of, I, what kind of answer I was kind of looking for. I think they're exciting ideas. I realize they, 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 they cost money and they cost staff time. It's easy to talk about, well, we could do this and gee, some of the things you're talking about, uh, but staff is limited. Right. I, I, you know, for some of these things, once you set them up, I mean, once you design the survey questionnaire, adding it to your existing questionnaire is a relatively low cost. Right. Once you set up the capacity to blog or, or to post comments, that is. Where you will, where we have staffing it, problems is, well, how much of the stuff can I read and respond to? Mm -hmm. usually becomes an issue. And then, of course, anything doing live things becomes a little bit more of a, of a, a complexity, both in the connection of it and in the cost. But, you know, you can roll out some things. You could try it. Um, and, and just, but, the, but you know, I, I think that the, what I like to think of is, is people are, are busy people, and they are interested, but you've only got so much time. Um, and things that you can devote, and so really, what's the most? I mean, I just think if you just ask people, mm -hmm. what's the most effective way um, to communicate? And, and frankly, you've probably got a more vocal constituent pool than most um, that will give you quality feedback. <laughs> well, they'll certainly give it to us in quantity. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Great. Do you have any? Are there any other questions? This has been really terrific. I appreciate your taking the time. I've learned a lot. Um, I've never had things such an engaged audience at 9.30 at night. <laughs> you I know. know. And I'm, I'm very sorry we uh, went off. Right. Right. But we're not even, you know, 11 yet. Geez, we're going home early. <laughs> um. Anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Great. Anything else, I think? We're adjourned. Love it. So the reason why, as the chair of the full... <laughs>